Cool. Um, we are at 10. Um, so Esther, do you want to go ahead and get started? And then we will just go with the next investors. I see CC and other people, so I'll call I'll call people out as I see them. Sure. Uh, like Jeremy said, I'm the co-founder of uh, Rocket Mindset and a couple other things that we do together. We run the VC together. Uh, started off as a finance accounting um, person, I guess. I have a finance degree. Started getting interested in investment. Started trading. Uh, got my Series 65, my SIE. And then kind of went headfirst into venture capital from trading, I guess. Realized that I like investing in other people's dreams more than I like trading numbers on a graph because money only gets you so far. Um, and around that time when I started raising for the venture capital fund, Jeremy and I met. We're like, we're great partners. Let's do this thing. And so together we've kind of been paving the way, impact lives and taking the more altruistic approach. I guess so that is my intro. <laughs> All right. Love it. Um, Davidson. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Davidson. Um, I started out as a lawyer and management consultant, um, moved into angel investing about eight, eight years ago and did that along with uh, my, my advisory work, uh, moved into venture capital about two years ago. We raised the fund and um, domiciled in the low, in in uh, Michigan at the moment, and we basically invest in Africa and North American founders. Um, our thesis is us investing in fintech, edtech, health tech. We sometimes can be sector agnostic depending on the solution being provided. So if AI is uh, in the say um, climate tech space and is doing really exciting stuff that can scale and make an impact globally we would look at that as well yeah. awesome awesome cool. thanks um and then uh, i'm going down the evan fisher you can go ahead next i'm just going right down the list of the of the banner in order so whoever's here so evan fisher you can go ahead and do your 60 second intro next absolutely so very simple former investment banker um i work with advise and invest alongside Founders that are in either late seed, uh, but more likely Series A through Series C, all the way up to um, pre-IPO in certain instances, um, invest alongside them, uh, package up their their pitches, make sure that it's actually investor ready. Um, the highlights, uh, clients of mine have gotten investment from Andreessen Horowitz, SoftBank, Tiger, you name it, big name, uh, we've done it. Uh, all said and done. Five billion plus uh, in the bag. Awesome, love it, Evan. And right, I'm going to jump back to Jeff Lavin. Hey, good day, all. Um, Jeff Lavin, former professional snowboarder in the mid 2000s. Um, I'm a private equity general partner and investment banker with Pacific Capital. Um, I oversee special projects. We're industry agnostic. Um, our project scope typically ranges from 100 million to 21 billion dollars. Um, I oversee 80 billion in assets under management. And then my favorite thing to do is take deals and de-risk them um, by registering with the SEC and building a sweet capital stack with institutional funds behind it. So that's my love language. So cool. That's me. I love it. Thank you for coming back to the event. Um, yeah, I, I loved your chat last time, uh, Jeff, on the speaking events. Um, let's go to Ryan Zachary from Clear Vision Equity Partners if you are here. Hey, Brian Zachary. Um, my background is in finance and data analytics. I'm a partner with Clear Vision Equity Partners. Uh, we like to be involved and continue investing through the company's life cycle. We invest C to Series C. Um, I sit on the board of many of our companies. Our check size is about a quarter million to three million. We're agnostic, uh, so we invest in basically every industry except for biotech or pharma. And we like a lot of the smaller markets. Many of our investments, in fact, are in San Diego. Love it. Awesome. Uh, Amira Abbasi. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. No. <laughs> I'll let you, uh, yeah, I'll let you re-enter. Yeah. Um, CC Bella. Hi everyone. Um, I'm CC. I'm a former professional tennis player. Uh, jumped into VC almost five years ago uh, at a sports tech focus firm and just launched my own fund uh, last year. Focuses on sports and health tech. Um, seed and Series A is kind of our bread and butter. 
initial check sizes, quarter million, two million, um, and we invest globally. Excited to be here. Love it. Love it. Uh, let's go, Casey. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me over again. Um, I'm Casey Van Manen. Uh, I'm with LOI Venture. It's an early, early stage emerging fund out in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we focus primarily on pre-seed to seed stage deals, uh, sector agnostic, and then we have a 75-25 split between focusing on youth entrepreneurs under 30 that are based in Canada, and then um, anything, uh, any opportunity in those two stages, um, either in Canada or the United States. Uh, I've personally been in venture for about two years and have been with the fund for about a year. Awesome. Awesome. Love it, Casey. Uh, Urvashi, if you were here. And that's fine if you're not. Um, I know that some investors won't be able to make the first beginning. Uh, Taha, also, I didn't see your name actually come in. So if you're here, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, the next name is uh, Phil McSweeney. Good morning. Um, I'm Phil McSweeney. I'm an angel investor. I'm also a chair of a company. Uh, I'm, my background is health. Um, I chair a company that develops electronic medical records. Uh, I'm also a mentor for several founders, several startups, um, and I'm more interested in the human side of um, investing or investors um, and founders. Um, and I work with a number of founders to explore things like investor psychology, storytelling, developing competitive advantage, developing their um, pitching skills, um, uh, and hopefully helping them become winners. I'm also an author. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, author of Angel Think. Uh, yes. Angel Think is the book, yeah. And then uh, Michael Cohen. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Cowan, Managing Partner at R Ventures, based out of Dublin, Ireland. Um, but we have a global reach, including all the way down to native New Zealand at the bottom of the planet. We operate exclusively in the consumer space. So uh, in our in our parlance, fast moving consumer goods or, or consumer packaged goods in North America. Um, but we predominantly operate in the food and beverage space, particularly with uh, I have a background as a senior executive at McDonald's, Red Bull, Diageo, PepsiCo. So part of our, we have two funds. Uh, one's a fledgling um, beverage fund called Laquire One, which is uh, up to 20 million. And our second fund is uh, Sabuskis, which is a food fund, which is a 50 million euro fund, um, predominantly around looking for sustainable food systems um, for, to make the planet go, ah, uh, is our, is our tag, tagline. Um, and uh, yeah, we, you know, any food and beverage um, companies that we invest in, we also follow the money in with, with our expertise as non-executive directors um, and accelerators. And that's me. Thank you. Love it. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, I don't think I saw Sophia uh, in, but if you are in, go ahead. Um, okay. And then I, cause I, I, yeah, I don't remember clicking except for that one. Um, I don't see her in here yet. So she might come in later. Um, let's go to Christopher James. I believe I saw Christopher in. Christopher James. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great, great. I run Funds Flow. Uh, we do two things. We direct invest typically between $3 million is the minimum check. We'll go all the way up to $75 million, and we raise capital. We raised over a billion dollars over the last four years for clients, and we handle that process A to Z. You do have to qualify for that, but if you do, we take care of it. We're industry agnostic. We cover about eight different industries. And typically, we look for inefficiencies in the marketplace that the company is filling, and we look for high synergy among founders when there's partners involved and when there's management involved with the partners early stage. We look at pre-seed all the way up to Series A, occasionally Series B, but typically, we don't go that far. Awesome. Awesome. Um. Cool. So we are, because because some of the other investors will come in later, we have six minutes until the next portion, which is good. Um, I will reiterate, looks like, yeah, so you guys are commenting. We have 80 people in here so far. You guys are commenting uh, for the new people that joined. Go ahead and drop your LinkedIn, drop something about you, about your investment firm, or if you're a founder. Um, not every, like we have 20-ish people for the investor panel and vendors, and then we have 
uh, 27 or so founders, but we we have obviously a lot more people in the room. So other founders and investors are in the room. Um, I believe I saw uh, Danielle Patterson. If you want to give a 60 second intro, you feel free. I know we haven't chatted yet. That's totally just random. Um, if you want to hop on, you can say something. Um, we have a lot of people in the room that are just um, investors that were not listed on the panel and uh, and connected and then other founders as well. So, so connect in the chat. Share your LinkedIn, share a little one sentence about you. Brief, brief brevity and clarity is is great, just like uh, pitches. Um, and so we're doing two minute pitches today. I know uh, the recording will hear this twice, but um, two minute pitches today, two minutes Q and A. So each, each founder will pitch for two minutes. Um, they follow a 10 sentence roughly structure. Um, pre to these events, what you guys don't see in the background is I, I semi filter and make sure that we have brevity and clarity. Um, I, I review hundreds of pitches each week. So they, they, they send me a 10 sentence pitch, which has all the key core elements that a slide deck would have. Um, it's part of my perfect pitch post that I that I posted out on LinkedIn. Um, so they they everybody that's pitching today has gone through that. And so what's going to happen in their two minutes is they will essentially kind of say those ten sentences, but they'll also have a, a bit of extra time to fit into the two minutes. Um, this is this is how I ensure that we're going to get the right core details in those two minutes. Because just like a company has defensibility and people have defensibility, I want to make sure these pitch events have defensibility. And defensibility means having a lot of capital at the event through the large investor panel, plus also being these video recordings being sent out to more investors. That way founders, when they pitch in one two minute slot, and sometimes they will just come on for their two minutes plus two minutes Q and A, their four minute slot, they will also know that they're getting in front of a lot of capital. Um, and then investors obviously come more and more when they know there is high quality, high scale founders. And so I vet for traction and I vet for team at a high level. And then I keep the rest of the vetting for um, anyone else. So um, we have four minutes until we start the next vendor section. So uh, as long as the six vendors are kind of ready there for their one minute, and then we'll get started with the uh, Max Pog and and uh, and founder pitching. So, um, what else should I say? I'll talk probably a little bit later about just what I think about um, near the end of the event, um, founder scale and founder um, quality. Um, part of the part of the challenge in the world is every investor trying to find the high quality, high scale founder. And that's the, what I believe is like the rarest thing, hardest thing in the world. And so we, we do founder mentoring, building out a founder mentoring army, building out courses, um, and ultimately building out software to where we do actually truly reach billion scale in terms of founders and investors being connected and up-leveled. Connected, some communities are connecting founders and investors, but we actually need to go further than that and up-level um, founders. Up-leveling a human being to, to be able to manage other human beings is really, really important. Um, it's only the beginning first six to 12 months of, of being a founder that you're wearing 27 million different hats, trying to learn how to do marketing at 5% capacity, engineering at 5% capacity, accounting, et cetera. Um, but after that time, 95% of your journey on a seven to 10 year IPO is people science. And so being able to interact with customers, partners, investors, and employees, those four and managing teams and teams of people is your people science is, is that number one core trait. And so when we hear founders pitch, um, seeing how they are with communication um, is really, really important because that's, that's the majority of the journey. So um, it's not actually being a great engineer, a great marketer, because those are the things you're going to delegate out. So, um, and that is the core thing in the world. A lot, a lot of a lot of people aren't realizing when they're they're looking for investment or they're looking for what's the company strategy to win, what's the marketing strategy to win. Um, they're not realizing yet, and we're just displaying that more and more that personal development is is one of the most important things for a founder to do, and communication, getting really really good at communication, because communication allows you to listen to that other person and write the right copy. I've done hundred thousand dollar day media buying budgets, and where we change one word and made three hundred thousand dollars more from one word change, which affects the CTR at top of funnel to then um, CVR as well when we cascade it down there, and then you affect AOV and LTV. Every company is a clear polynomial function. Um, a lot of people do see that companies can be really really hard, but every single aspect from the copy to the CTR to the CVR to the difficulty gradient of the problem, which affects the CTR as well, um, everything. And then as far as managing uh, teams and teams of people, how well teams make their estimates, um, are they going to be done in four weeks when they say it, or are they going to be done in six or eight weeks? And how is that affected based on team working together um, between a marketer and engineer or two or three engineers together and how the code styles are done? All of that matters. And so communication really, really matters in companies. And so when we imbue these great high quality, high skill um, attributes in founders who can then cascade it to their management layers, who then cascade it to the ICs, you then get more reliable company estimates and you get more reliable output by looking at communication, personal development, um, and then and then layering on strategy and everything else on top of that. So we have one minute before vendors. Um, that is a level overview. Uh, Jeremy, just to call yeah. out, uh, the participants share screen has been disabled for now. Okay, let me look at the settings. Thank you for that, because I don't want you okay, guys to thanks. lose the time. Yep, for, um, I'm gonna look at advanced sharing. Who can share? Okay, I'm just changing it to all participants now. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah. Because um, yes. Uh, so we have a okay. So Shukri, um, we're gonna go get started now uh, with the faster faster timer stuff. So Shukri, go ahead. You have your your ten slap. Hi, I'm Shukri, founder of BitLab, a product development studio. We help founders go from idea to a minimum viable product in under ninety days. We worked with founders from Uber, and Tesla. We built a medical startup in nine months, raised four million now live at major clinics. We rebuilt the marketplace in entertainment under 90 days while raising from Angel. I've been building software for 17 years and I love the messiness of the early stage startup and taking the chaos and turning it into massive value. I've been a solo founder before and I know how hard the journey can be. So my goal is to help you win. I love it. Um, I don't know all the vendors today, but I do know Shukri and he's doing a lot of really good work. So um, vendors right now for this six minutes are essentially pitching founders. And so any founders that, that need dev work and essentially what, what Shukri just said, um, Shukri is an, an amazing one. Uh, Trevor, let's go with Trevor. Um, amazing. Um, yep. I've had you a lot of my events, so. I don't hear anything yet, but I see slides. There you go. Sorry, my bad. What would it be worth to you if you knew your startup would succeed, what could you accomplish if you didn't have to worry about finding customers? What could you build if commercial success wasn't your main problem? I'm Trevor. I'm founder and CEO of Crowd Tamers. We build million dollar marketing engines for startups and new ideas backed by a guarantee. If you don't make it work, you get your money back. I've launched more than $70 million marketing engine in the last three years, and I have yet to give anybody back the money, so it's a pretty safe guarantee. If you want to launch your startup with a proven method, reach out and let me know. Go to crowdtamers.com and click the big green button and let's chat. Thanks. Good luck to all you founders. It's hard work, but it's worth it. I love it. Um, yeah, as I as I mentor founders, um, I connect a lot of people from my network, um, uh, like like Trevor doing marketing or Shukri for Dev into the founders. Um, it's it's effectively like a venture studio without borders. Um, I'm formerly more mentoring and a VC, but um, uh, connecting Trevor in with a lot of companies, $71 million um, marketing engines. He's really, really good at what he does there. Um, but Sean, we have uh, Bashan next. Hey, how's everyone doing? So my name is Bashan. I'm the founder and CEO of Pagin. We essentially give startups a line of credit. Um, there's no personal guarantee. There's no social security number required. There's no a uh, hard credit check, none of that. It's going to be the first time you guys hear a lot of no's uh, during this pitch event that you're actually going to like hearing. Uh, we encourage every founder, whether you raise capital or not, to join in. We have capital for everyone. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, everyone here is just here to get money. So, you know, hit me up after the pitch. That's it. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I think it's I think I think it's awesome that uh, we have a lot of the investors here to give out capital, but also uh, Vishan is able to in uh, in, a, in a debt format, and so um, and he's changing, he's lowering the the requirements. He usually supports VC backed companies, and he's lowering the requirements so that a lot more people can get access to capital. So um, check out Vishan because if you don't get picked by uh, investor based on not investor thesis match, etc., um, Vishan may be an option for for whoever is interested in that. Uh, let's go to Miko. Cool. Hi everyone, I'm Miko Kavanaugh. I'm one of the three founders of Scale U. I don't know if you guys can see my screen, but yes. we're basically a, a staffing and recruiting firm, uh, which is focused on recruiting for series, uh, for seed series to series B startups for recruiting for their engineering go-to-market talent. So the current makeup of our team, as you can see here, I'm based in New York City. My two other co-founders is based in San Francisco and the other is in Boston. Um, let me just show this. One is in San Francisco and one is in Boston and I'm in New York City. As you can see here, we all have experience with big tech recruiting, whether it be for engineering recruiting or sales recruiting in big tech and early stage startups. The next slide focuses on our customer focus and role breakdown. On this slide, you'll be able to see some of the VCs that we work with and some of the startups that we work with as well. As of 2024, we've successfully placed an ML engineer for a series A startup, a founding front end engineer for a series, a seed series startup in New York City, and completed a recruiting and consulting assignment with a Series B startup. Currently, we're partnering with a Series B fintech from LATAM to hire their initial U.S. engineers and an, and an Australian-based startup to hire their go-to-market here in the U.S. As for slide four, you'll see our goals for the rest of the year. We really aim to work with at least getting three placements per month. 
We aim to work with at least 20 startups and partner with three VCs for the rest of the year to help them recruit for their portfolio companies. So if you're interested in working with us, feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn or my email is above. It's Miko at letscaleu.com. Thanks. Love it. Uh, let's go, Michael, next. Hello, my name is Michael Orndoff. I'm a fractional revenue operations consultant. I work with founders and executives to bring order to their chaotic go-to-market systems and processes from scrappy bootstrap startups with 16 and a half million in annual recurring revenues to pre-IPO behemoths with 230 plus million in annual recurring revenues. There's always more to unearth in these organizations from questions about forecast confidence, pipeline accuracy, and revenue at risk. Within the first 30 days of engagement, I put these worries at ease by stabilizing their current practices, creating standards and rigor and process supported by systems and enablement to deliver transparency and accuracy cross-functionally. Success looks like an efficient system and process yielding scalable growth and expansion. This methodology of stabilizing, standardizing, and optimizing enables us to deliver exceptional results to end customers and drive more revenue. This improves customer attention, increases referrals and velocity in all go-to-market motions, generating more revenue and de-risking the organization, improving investor confidence. Thank you for your time. Appreciate the opportunity. Love it. Thank you, Michael. Let's go to Jordan B. Can he do it? Yes, he can. Uh, hey, I'm Jordan Bean. Um, my agency, Narrate, does uh, thought leadership social media for founder-led sales. I say founder-led sales, but of course, anybody who is social selling, any thought leader uh, can use these systems. Um, I'm telling you a bunch of stuff you already know. I, I've been doing social media since before we had a name for it. Um, don't have a lot of time to talk about credentials, but... Uh, let's talk about yours. Founder network, biggest lever for growth. You have to have customer conversations. Your personal brand matters. Essentially, uh, as a founder, you have to be out there uh, posting to LinkedIn, and that enables founder-led sales, and I can coach you to uh, to close those people as well. Uh, we What we do is very simple. We do two 30-minute podcast-style interviews a month, and from that, we produce uh, video clips, text posts, articles, images, et cetera. Um, you show up for those two 30 minute calls, you review your content in notion. We do all the scheduling for you. And of course, I also coach you as to how to close those sales. Um, and so, uh, all you have to do is follow up with the engagement that you receive. We also, I don't have time to talk about this, but we also help you with outbound to build your network with the right kind of people in your ICP. And we do flat rate pricing, $2,000 USD per month, please uh, contact me in any one of these ways, but I would prefer that you DM me on LinkedIn and I'll show you how to close a sale from DMs. Awesome, thank you, Jordan. Uh, let's go next up, Max Pog, talking about uh, intro yourself and talking about uh, Venture Studios a little bit for a few minutes. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So I have a special trick and uh, I want to ask you to look at this presentation because you can miss how super founders can uh, get superpowers with Venture Studios. And I have five minutes, five minutes to, to tell you about it. So what are superpowers? So first you will know how to create a very inspiring, inspiring atmosphere uh, with your investors using this super skill nunchucks. Uh, but also, also I will share my presentation now for uh, to tell what, what are venture studios and how super founders can get superpowers by joining them. So, um, uh, I did a lot of projects around venture studios, seven months research, uh, venture studio online conferences. We had three, uh, and one we see online conference also. Then we have a big community of venture studios. And uh, I record Venture Studio podcast. So Venture Studio is uh, such an entity which partners with entrepreneurs with or without ideas and uh, create several startups a year. So an entrepreneur can get full-time uh, support from uh, the studio team, usually uh, several people at least working full-time with you. Then studio investments. Uh, and uh, if you will look at different VC players, so you will find that Venture Studios or Startup Studios are the only full-time co-founders. 
So incubators and accelerators can help you with fundraising and win some connections. Uh, VCs can help you to, to get money and to uh, accelerate your, your growth. But uh, startup studios, they are full-time co-founders. So they have money, team, and um, they work with you maybe for one year, maybe for two years to get revenue faster for your startup and to uh, fundraise faster. So you can find a lot of statistics showing that uh, studios uh, help uh, startups get uh, funding faster. Those startups are more viable. Yeah, and uh, the reason why to join a studio um, is that a studio has accumulation. So a studio accumulated their expertise for uh, launching maybe 10 companies, maybe 20 companies, maybe 30 companies. And uh, uh, VCs generate high returns when partnering with uh, founders, second time founders, or those who already sold their company. So if you look at statistics, you will find that uh, a first time founder, previous companies founded zero, uh, has a exit rate of 5%. But if this founder launches uh, his or her fifth company, so it's already uh, more than 10% uh, probability of exit. And when you partner with the studio, it's actually this uh, co-founder which launched five companies, uh, 20 companies or more. And this is why uh, uh, it's very beneficial for founders to consider joining studios in order to have faster traction. Uh, if you want to find some studios in your region, you can go to uh, Enhance Ventures, find the startup studio map with more than 900 startups. Or you can go to Studio Hub and find also a startup studio map. Or you can find a uh, global venture studio database by Diana Lizash with uh, more than 500 studios uh, with dif in different sectors. So the studios are growing very fast. So during the last five years, they doubled in the number. Uh, and this is why I encourage you to look more closely at, uh, at this uh, type of companies to partner with. Um, we'll have in one week a Venture Studio online conference. Uh, if you want to get invited, just connect me on LinkedIn and uh, I will send you the free invitation to our Venture Studio online conference. I can send this presentation so you have the links for, for those maps. And also uh, I will share my seven months research with where I refer to more than 100 sources uh, on LinkedIn. Yeah, so this is my LinkedIn profile. I'll send it in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Max. Um, Max ran a, a big VC event uh, recently. Really good, good, great person to connect to. Um, really knows Venture Studios. Uh, Venture Studio is something that uh, I'm I'm really involved with as well. Um, it is a it is a great model, not fit for everybody, but it is a really great model that I'm I'm heavily into. It de-risks the growth of companies. Um, so. Let's get into, and I'm noting that we are two minutes off schedule, which is fine. So I'm just noting that for each time. Um, some people might have gaps and we might get right back on schedule. That happened at last event. So uh, let's get with the first founder, Andrew. Andrew C. Yes. Hello. Pleasure to be first. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm the CEO of Discovered. We are an artisan marketplace. I originally started out being an entrepreneur, focusing on impact in businesses because I really want to make a better change for my two sons. This is the uh, second business I founded. I founded a sustainable fashion marketplace, which unfortunately closed out in 2021. That's why I was able to take over the management team at Discovered. Uh, Discovered itself has been around since 2014. It was founded as an NGO, um, but I took over in Q4 2021 after some tough times after COVID. In my first full year, we had 80% year-on-year -year growth with over just under 800,000 in revenue. Last year, we hit over a million. Um, we yeah we didn't have any external funding to get us that one million. So far, we've partnered with over a hundred artists and businesses. We employ around five hundred people, all from developing countries. Since two thousand fourteen, we sent over two million in revenues to artisans, and our sales we've generated around three point three million in revenues, um, which equates to around fifty five thousand orders and thirty five thousand customers. We are seeking one million to scale our U.S. operations. 
and we're doing so on what we believe is a generous two million pre-money valuation. So we're really looking for the right partner to join us. We want someone who understands impact businesses and scaling them accordingly. Really, our main focus is on creating sustainable growth for our artists and partners and yeah, doing good things together to, to make sure that people are purchasing nice products at affordable prices. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, Andrew. Any investor questions for the next minute or two? Any investor questions for him? Three million traction is a is a three point three is a great start. And um, for any investors that don't have questions because some investors just might not be in thesis, um, that's fine. Um, if there's no questions, that just means either great pitch or or not necessarily a fit for the investors that are on the panel. But um, there are other investors that will be seeing the recording anyway. So. Um, it's still great. So, okay. If no questions, then we will go on to. Thanks, guys. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. We will go on to Anastasia. We've regained our time back too. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Jeremy, glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm Anastasia, CEO and co-founder of Beard and a former IP lawyer. I've been working with my partner and co-founder, Dr. Olga Simpson, for over three years and covered over 30 projects. And that's when we realized after not only being a lawyer a team, but also educating over 5,000 creators on the complexities of IP law, that licensing is actually broken. And that even though it's a $200 billion market and we cannot live even 10 seconds without interacting with some kind of licensed content, uh, companies are still spending months and crazy budgets on just making even simple deals. Now we're a team of nine, where Alex is also bringing the technical experience and background in AI and blockchain, why I bring managerial and Olga legal background. As of right now, we already have traction and launched SaaS after being accelerated by L'Oreal Group and Meta. Uh, just after one week of launching SaaS, we have 12 clients, 27 for Q1 and over 214 pipeline with 120K of from beta stage. Uh, we are actually making licensing work. So how our product works, that's a B2B SaaS, where upon getting a subscription, you get the admin panel, which fully automates your licensing, resulting in lower costs for your operations and, of course, higher revenue. While for your buyer, instead of this weeks, months, tons of documents and transactions, it's literally just one click to get a license. We are ready to scale uh, to 800K IRR, and for that, we are raising $2 million as a Delaware C-Corp. Thank you so much, and... Let's make license and finally work. Thank you, Anastasia. Any investor questions for Anastasia, whether it's for your investment thesis or whether you, I, obviously the priority for investor is if you're interested, ask your questions. Um, and if you're not interested and nobody else is asking questions, investors can still ask questions to prompt um, the founder. Casey, go ahead. I see your hand. Hey, Anastasia, appreciate the uh, the pitch. Uh, I've seen a couple of startups like this in the um, also in IP, but looking at, say, patents or uh, trademarks. How do the market sizes compare and say maybe the competitive landscapes in your silo? Yeah, thank you for the question. Overall, I would say the patents and trademarks are a very small fraction of the IP market globally because the majority here is copyright. Music, music, gaming, art industry, all of it is actually what contributes to $280 billion market, even sports industry, which I know some people are from on this call. Uh, so we are uh, not comparing ourselves to the patent management because that's a governmental side. Uh, in terms of competition, we have two segments. We have licensing tools like, for instance, DocuSign or Remastered, which cover only the agreements, which we believe is not good enough and not sufficient because licensing is a mixture of legal tech and finance. So we automate the full cycle instead. We also have Web3 competitors and I would be happy to follow up on that uh, to you personally. Awesome. I see uh, I see another question, but I'm not going to call it out. Uh, if you can put it in the chat to her, that works because we're going to move to the next one for um, Darren. Um, you are next. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll leave my contacts. So please ask any questions you have. Yes, drop your contacts. Hi, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it, Jeremy. So, um, so my name is Darren Webster. I'm the founder and CEO of Golster. Golster is a cloud-based mobile-first platform that's designed to help people and organizations achieve their most important goals by connecting their strategy to the execution that's required to actually achieve it. So where this was born from was my, uh, three major experiences that I've had in my life. Uh, I represented Australia at the World Championships for sprint kayaking. Uh, was part of the Australian Institute of Sport. So as an as an individual contributor, I know what it's like to to succeed in that in that endeavour. 
I began working at Verizon as a part-time retail sales rep after my, my kayaking career, but left having created the entire company's physical distribution strategy and led teams of 1,200 plus people. So I understood what it's like to lead a large group of organizational uh, assets to be able to drive them towards particular goals. But then I had a third experience, which was leaving to become a consultant and realizing the problems that are faced by consultants of, and consulting firms of all sizes. That's what makes Goalster very unique. It's not a learning management system. It's not a project management tool. It's not an HRIS. What it is, it's an employee achievement platform or what we call a coach in the pocket. So in terms of our traction, we've already cleared 15,000 MRR. We have customers in three different countries, including Comcast, as well as a publicly traded UK consulting firm. Uh, we have a, over 150,000 MRR active in our funnel right now, and we have a path to profitability, which could be as soon as May. In terms of our team, we have a very small but a very talented team, uh, most of whom worked for me in some capacity when I was with Verizon. Uh, our chief platform architect um, created all of Verizon's cloud infrastructure on AWS and actually gave up a very lucrative job to come and work for us. Uh, my head of sales also worked for me as one of my largest store managers. She quit her job to come work for us at, uh, at the company. And so our investors are all former senior executives of Verizon and, and among other companies, which includes the chief, former chief legal officer, former head of Verizon business, as well as the former head of Verizon consumer and the head of HR for, the, for SHRM, for those who are in, uh, in, in the HR space. So we have a very solid team. We have uh, a really good opportunity in front of us. And the problem that we solve for businesses is really about execution. How do we get organizations rally around doing the things that drive the right outcomes in a more efficient and more effective way? For consulting firms, what we add is a suite of digital services that they can now sell to their own customers, driving new recurring revenue and an opportunity to go and re-engage customers that aren't billing. So the opportunity in front of us is to really make sure that we use these distributors to get to the enterprise customers, deliver a great experience, and the market opportunity is huge. In the US, companies like Verizon spend $370 billion on training and development. There's a $260 billion US management consulting market and both of which we can attack. Uh, what I'm looking for is to close out our seed round, looking for 300 to 500,000 probably at this stage and uh, and looking forward to, uh, to chatting further. Awesome, thank you, Darren. We have about 30 to 60 seconds for questions. Investors, any investor questions on this one? Checking, checking, checking. Okay. Either either that means great pitch or just other investors uh, that will see the recording afterwards. Um, so that, that's really great. Um, so love that. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Khalid, do we have you on the call? I'm not sure how many names. Yes, yes, awesome. Let's go, Khalid. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Khalid, the CEO and founder of Paramount Student. Well, Paramount Student is uh, originated from my extensive involvement in education and tourism. Formerly, the top person of, for group of the event, I transit into connecting students with universities, leading the creation of this company. Currently, it costs thousands of dollars through the agencies and the use of Salesforce, HubSpot to connect high school students with universities. This problem spans the globe, and uh, we developed, we built a dedicated app to defriction the process and solve it. The solution we present to universities is so needed that universities across the US, UK, Europe, Australia, UAE, Turkey, and others are willing to pay 8 to 35% of first year to just to solve it. It means $1,000 to $6,000 per student. I've pulled over 200 volunteers who have been helping me build this globally. We have universities and high school uh, partnership globally, and we will become de facto standard around the student experience, verification between high school and university and the uh, university tour and much more in specific order of release uh, of features and product. We also have an advisor who has uh, run a $100 million marketing budget who have been very helpful and deeply involved. With 2 million seats, we plan to 
to scale up to uh, to uh, to 500 university partner with 5000 high school and uh, places over 10000 students changing their life forever and already we secure uh, 3 million term sheet in pre in pre seed just uh, we are here in uh, to see explore additional option and thank you, Mr. Jeremy, for having me. Uh, it's my honor. Thank you, Khalid. Yeah, three million term sheet is exciting. Um, any investor questions? Casey, go ahead. Uh, what is the sales cycle selling into higher education? I know I've seen a, a couple other things in the space. It tends to be quite long. It tends to be fairly bureaucratic. So uh, are you able to get in uh, more quickly and more efficiently? Well, we are trying to change the student mobility in the world and we are trying to make it more open as we are involved in a term is called education tourism. No, currently I will just give a quick number like there is around 5.8 million students who is uh, uh, in uh, international student in only five uh, and there is around just uh, around 3.5 million students in only five countries, USA, Canada, UK. France and Australia, but uh, with our system, it can other uni other universities it will be more visible. So what we did, we create just pipeline of high school, and we are letting university advertise anywhere in the world, and to be more visible, and they can attract more students, which it will cost them less and attract more applicant. Excellent. Thank you. I'll follow up. Awesome. Uh, any last questions with the last 30 seconds for this? Cool. Awesome. Great, great, great pitch, Colin. Um, let's go next up, Chris. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Jutowski. I'm the CEO and founder of Marizeli, a women's fashion brand. Previously, I was a photographer and created a brand selling digital products for photographers. I believe in beauty and want to see more of it in our lives, surroundings, and culture. While searching for beautiful feminine dresses with my wife, I discovered a gap in the fashion industry. There was room for a new brand, a brand that inspires beauty and femininity through natural, comfortable dresses. So I founded one and named it Marizeli. Fast forward a few years, through direct-to-customer model, we've generated over $17 million in sales, served more than 60,000 customers and sold upwards of 400,000 products, nearing $700,000 in monthly sales. We've harnessed the power of social media and influencers forming hundreds of partnerships. Now, I am moving the brand to the Delaware C-Corp Rosa Hortis to continue the growth of Marie Zelie within the US market. The goal is to reach the top 100 global fashion companies. We are currently raising half a million dollars now and three million dollars in total this year. Join us in celebrating beauty with Marie Zeli. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for Chris? I, think, I believe 17 million traction is, is great. Um, any questions for Chris? Phil, go ahead. Uh, Chris, I'm you know given that you have such great uh, revenue, I'm intrigued as to what you want the money for, what what you'll do with it. Yeah, that's a good question. We've made some significant changes in recent years uh, in our model, and uh, so uh, we uh, actually we we are moving the company uh, like the brand to this new US company, so. Uh, we have to pay for the acquisition and for the uh, also for the US, like this money will be used for the US growth and for the inventory, as this is the main, you know, um, money cost in this business. Okay, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, any other, we have about two minutes still on Chris. Do any other investors have questions? Awesome. Sounds like investment um, or marketing. Yeah, go ahead. I do have a question for Chris. Um, where exactly uh, do you source your products from? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Because 
we created like a small batches manufacturing in Poland originally. And recently we started to add uh, Asian sourcing for uh, more popular uh, designs. So uh, we have a great network of manufacturers in Poland uh, that uh, let us create uh, batches as small as 30 or 50 pieces uh, instead of 500 pieces like MOQ in Asia. Um, could you be more specific where in Asia you're considering uh, sourcing or have been sourcing from? Yeah, so uh, we we have some, uh, you know, uh, tested uh, factories in Bangladesh and China uh, that were tested by our fashion buyers before and, you know, meet all the standards uh, required right now from these sources. Well, oh, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, that's great. Yeah, these these pitches. Thank you, are, Thank you Jeremy. These pitches are just uh, minimal information to kind of get an investor's interest, and then even the questions are just minimal um, yeah. questions, which is great. And so this is this is perfect. Um, and then as investors want to reach out to founders, you guys are sharing LinkedIn's in the chat. You guys, any investor can connect to me if they if they want to connect to a founder, and then I can connect them after the event as well. So um, everything's going perfectly there. Uh, let's go up next to David. David S. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm an ex semi pro rugby player, so I'm super passionate about health and fitness. I built my first startup to having 3,000 paying customers, so I also love technology and helping people win. After my master's, I spent eight years on trading floors in London and I built desks from zero to 1.2 million in 18 months. I've been in gyms and training outdoors my whole life, so I understand all the industry problems. Trainers pay extortionate rent. A lot of people don't like gyms and studios, and outdoor fitness is an underserviced market with technology. I'd always see people training outside, and I always wanted to book into the class, but I couldn't find how to do it. So I knew I was the person to change the industry and I swapped finance for fitness to solve my own personal problem of booking into outdoor classes to become a fitness and wellness broker. I'm David Stapleton, the founder and CEO of Booafit, which is a marketplace for group fitness and wellness classes outdoor, online and in office. We connect supply and demand and do everything from kickboxing to mental health journey to nutritional workshops. I met Sam and Waj on my journey who have 10 years experience in building softwares coming from backgrounds of working with JP Morgan. We've 25,000 customer transactions and we've done over a quarter of a million in revenue in pre-seed. We're on a mission to empower fitness professionals to succeed and inspire people like you to live a happier and healthier life. We're looking for two and a half million at seed to bring the business to doing three to four million in ARR so we can close our series A. We're looking to build an airport in the fitness and wellness industry to and, and do two and a half million classes per year, moving into deep technology, education, and to be a multi-billion dollar brand in lifestyle. Bua means victory in Gaelic, and I'm inviting you on the journey to be victorious with me and my team, and we can have some fun along the way. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Awesome, David. Uh, any investor questions? I shouldn't say uh, any. I just like I to got a so question. Sorry, um, I wanted to just ask, um, what's your revenue so far? So at Precede, we've done $260,000. Um, our last year, we did hundred and twenty. dollars So we did a couple, two years of testing and then um, six figures in, our, in year three. So in terms of your customer base, what what did you see in terms of growth from, the, from, from last year to order from the previous year to last year? Uh, we did 4X growth. Yeah, and we're we're a COVID survivor as well. Our outdoor fitness model closed. We launched online, so so it's been tough. It's been tough. <laughs> All right, thanks, Amira. Please go ahead. Sorry. 
I just wanted to say that was a really good pitch, David. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice. Good as are good as are great. Um, Phil, you have a question, and we have about a minute. So, yep, or half a minute. Hi, David. Thanks for that. Um, two quick questions. What's your kind of average customer spend? And then looking ahead, what are your exit thoughts? Who's going to buy you? Yeah, so uh, we we generate revenue from consumer corporates and trainers. Um, our corporates we range from sixteen hundred dollars up to sixty thousand dollars. In consumer, our average transaction is fourteen pounds fifty, and on supply we charge one hundred and fifty dollars a year to use the platform, and we take anything from a a five to 20% commission on the marketplace. So we sit in between the money. Okay. And exit. So um, the biggest player in the market is, is Mind Body. They've got a market cap of over 40 billion. Um, so that's a potential exit opportunity. We're focusing on empowering the solopreneur to succeed in wellness, whereas they focus on brands and studios. Um we yeah so we're not really focused on an exit right now we're focused on growing yeah. revenues. that that would be an option yeah cool. okay thank you thank you david uh let's go next up to my hello i'm my Moore, and i've experienced future of work issues firsthand with over 20 years of experience in the tech industry directly helping two companies go public travazoo and united online I've listened to 200 chief executive women with their traumatic stories and have served over 2,400 Gen Z, all experiencing DEI, pay gap issues, psychological safety needs, and a desire for a happier workplace. We at Boss Me In is leading to define the future work through increasing retention rates, which is costing corporations millions of dollars. And we envision boundless women bosses. BMI bridges the intergenerational gap for the future of work through inclusivity, connection, and transformation through our Boundless Bosses speaker series, co-bosses mentoring, boss it up integrated workshops, boss coaching, and boss mind think tanks testing through 19 events, 25 mentees, serving over 400 Gen Z with 100,000 in revenue from two large corporate partners. Our goal is 18.1 million in the next three years. And for this year, we are laser focused on 1.2 million with 500,000 in the next six months. We have a very specific Fortune 100 funnel drilling down to 10 company packages between 50,000 and 100,000 each. We understand that it takes everyone from the founder, CRO, marketing, product, and partnerships to holistically serve the pathway of the executive, middle manager, and Gen Z involved. We're looking for a $100,000 lead investor because we have 400,000 from two high level angels ready to commit for a total of 500,000 investment. We also have multiple chief executive women as angel investors, external ambassadors, advisors to help with sales, marketing and partnerships with multiple testimonials stating that we are timely. These dollars will support me, two co-founders and a CRO, each with 20 years experience from companies such as Twitter, DataLogic, ROI Healthcare Systems and JP Morgan Chase. We want to innovate and harness the community that we have cultivated beyond the current products and execute to close the revenue runway faster and smarter. Invest in women. Thank you. Thank you, Mai. Any investor questions or what investor questions for Mai? Casey, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Brian, for the pitch. Um, how many colleges are you in currently uh, in terms of uh, speaking engagements? Sure. So our original funnel was um, colleges, but we're now focused on the top Fortune 100 companies. Um, so um, we just think that that is a more streamlined approach and really um, the right approach to create and help with retention. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mai. Uh, let's go to Neil. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for organizing this, Jeremy, which I appreciate it. My name is Neil Fogarty. I have 35 years experience, ranging from founder and co-founder to director in the UK PLC, and recognize that corporate success hinges on both individual and organizational psychological health. After 15 years of consulting on four continents, in 2018, I met a fellow member of the Association for Business Psychology, Ian, 
a multi-award winning psychologist with four decades of experience in organizational, clinical and military psychology. Together, we work with Graham, our chief technologist, leveraging two decades in AI, uh, machine learning and data science. He's named on two AI patents and four research papers and has founded and operated four technology businesses with two exits. As Gyral, we are developing the first application of AI for organizational psychology called the Psychological Operating System. The first product based on this architecture is NewMe. It's a SaaS-based virtual companion that moves humans from one psychological state to another in a unique psychology and technology stack, captures and acts on as many as 21,000 behavioral vectors per conversation, which will create the world's largest behavioral metadata layer. We're focusing our initial sales efforts on uh, a £250 million opportunity in the UK's charity sector that will eventually lead us to address the global $28 billion opportunity of corporate psychological health. In our first eight months, we've secured our first paid client with 2,600 users talking to their own personalised therapist, as well as a number of inbound requests to pilot the technology that's with a total in excess of 1 million further users. Uh, we're looking for up to 350k to capitalize on growing client interest by completing the software development informed by user feedback and insights and expanding our sales team to hit 900k in 10 months and then revenue runway faster from there thank you thank you neil what investor questions do we have for neil okay that means it was very well explained Thank you. Awesome. 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 Great pitches today, everyone. Um, we have two minutes left technically on this one. Um, so I will, yeah, just interject. Yeah. Two minute pitches, two minutes Q and A. Um, this event is being recorded for anyone who just joined. I know uh, investors and founders that I've just been letting in have just joined. Um, Max Pog spoke earlier today. Uh, Tord will just join. We'll be speaking near the end uh, about funding stack, 150,000 investors. Um, we have a lot of investors on the call um, that were not on the panel that are also listening to the pitches. Um, I will be connecting investors and founders um, after the event, wherever investors are interested or investors should, can just see the founders LinkedIn as they drop them um, before and or after their speech um, and you can connect directly. Um, we will be scaling this up to globally as we build out the world's largest investor and founder network. And this is a lot of fun for me um, and Esther, my co-host. Um, so now we are at the next one. So let's go to Jess. Jeremy, I will share my screen. everyone, I'm Jazz, and I'm building the first ever revenue share relay model in the trucking industry. My motivation stems from watching my dad, my father-in-law, and several family members who have worked in freight logistics their entire life. Currently, if you know anything about trucking, the long-haul truck drivers spend 300 days living away from home. They sacrifice their physical, mental, and social health, while the shippers continue to struggle with slow deliveries that leads to high shipping costs if they continue to escalate. A little crash course about the trucking laws. For every 11 hours of driving, a driver is mandated to take a break for 10 hours. That means the freight and the driver are held hostage to these parking lots all across the country. Our solution is that the driver only drives five hours one way. They meet another driver at dedicated handoff locations. They unhook and hand off the fully loaded trailer to the next driver. In essence, the driver gets to come back home more often while the freight continues to move forward. This is also essential to doubling the range of EVs that are going to become a new normal in the coming years. Our MVP went live two weeks ago that allows direct load merging and load management between shippers and carriers. And happy to say, we just signed the first LOI for $150,000 two, two days ago. Once we reach a critical mass of drivers on selected routes, we are going to roll out the revenue share model. We have a slew of early adopters that have been working with managing these relays manually. We are starting with two business models, take rate and subscription fee, but are already generating a lot of interest for additional revenue streams, such as partnerships, insurance, and analytics. The key takeaway on the market sizing is Smart Hall is focused on the younger demographic that is prioritizing family time and also 
more open to new technology. The competitive metrics is really, really uh, high, but where we stand different is that we are the only ones trying to find the balance between human and freight needs. In terms of team composition between JB, Jim Connors, and Vivek, they all have multiple billion dollar exits under their belt. I have personally been able to scale multiple um, verticals within Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. Specific to supply chain, I work on large projects for companies like Walmart, Tumor BCT, and the Vita. We are raising $1.25 million and have aggressive goals in terms of ARR, speedier deliveries, and high driver take home paychecks. Thanks. Awesome, Jas. Great pitch. Um, what investor questions do we have? Yes, great pitch. I'm seeing some of the comments. Awesome. Um, for any of the founders where there aren't questions from the immediate investor panel, because there are other investors that will be viewing these recordings afterwards, um, feel free to use um, the one or two minutes anyway to, if you want to add anything extra um, in the next minute or so, um, go ahead and do that, uh, Jess. If there, if there is anything else that you want to add. But that was a great pitch. Um, I think I heard multi-billion dollar uh, exit um, founders in there. And that's that's great to have those not on your team. Um, and I'm reserving my questions because my brain power is for event management and watching the time and a million notifications on my screen. So I'm not asking questions. Otherwise, I would ask you guys a lot of questions um, because this is a lot of fun for me. So um, cool. Okay, great pitch. Let's go to Sajith. And I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. So please correct me because we have not spoke over audio before. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. I'll start with the charger. I'll share my uh, pitch deck too. Oh, one second. So uh, my name is Sajit Kumar. I'm the founder CEO of Chargerzilla. Uh, we are an electric vehicle charging station search and booking platform that is having AI and also cloud-based environment. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C., United States, and we cover the 50 states in the U.S. and also 50, uh, 10 provinces in Canada. So the major problem we are cracking is the uh, range anxiety and the lack of charging stations in the um, U.S. and Canada. So we are, our application is a solution that provides, uh, let the homeowners and the property owners rent out their charging stations and they'll be connecting the EV guest to the EV host. So it will generate income for the properties as well as the homeowners and also it is an increase the number of charging stations in the neighborhood work or on a road trip. So the, the EV market is growing and we are going to have 30 million vehicles on the road and this is the huge market going to be. Our product is launched already and it's been used by 200,000 users and we cross, we, our product has a lot of advantages over the competition. And this is a team that I'm, Sajid Kumar, I'm coming from the Department of Transportation. I was uh, working for the Biden administration based in Washington, D.C. And we have World Bank, and she's Dr. Krilova. She's another co-founder. We've been assisted, advised by industry expert, including Jane Vivi, who is the Executive Director of Electric Vehicle Manufacturing Association. And this is a um, market opportunity we are cracking, and we are going to focus on 2.5 billion. Now the market is growing. This is, I need to update my slide. It's going to be like around 6 billion new revised. So this is business model. We have B2B software. We are a SaaS based platform. And as well as we have now, we are planning to launch in the future. So, and also crack the uh, world global market. Uh, Dubai, India, and Finland, and also Mexico. We already launched in the US and Canada. We are growing so fast. And we have been selected by Techstars cohort program. They are going to invest $120,000. And we have a lot of uh, accomplishments. So we are raising 2.5 million seed capital to fund our new technology mobile apps, as well as the sales and marketing business partnerships with the Marriott hotels, rental car companies, hospital living facilities, hospitality companies. We also have an exit strategy for the investors who are curious. Our competitors got acquired, which are, we are really happy. Good luck to them. And we are the only neutral platform, uh, EV charger provider agnostic. We are one platform, only platform that has public charges from all EV charging companies, as well as the home and property honors and we are already covered in the news and and we have been an industry expert we are always invited to different events thank you awesome thank you great pitch um what investor questions do we have jeff this is mute mm -hmm. you're good i can hear you Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm on mute. Uh, great pitch, by the way. 
Um, are you familiar with the the credits the Biden administration has uh, earmarked where it's uh, half a billion dollars? And do you have a plan to capitalize on those? Because I believe that might fit into a sub-thesis that um, we have an existing project that might be a good fit. So let's connect. Yes, sure. Yeah, we have any, any help I can provide. I'm so close to the Department of Transportation, the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And we are also part of the advisory team on electrification summit by the White House. Awesome. I love I love the the random um, things that Jeff Jeff director of special projects hundred million to twenty one billion dollar project size eighty billion AUM. I'm just like I never know which because uh, like every other investor I'm like investment thesis and then Jeff's special project. <laughs> you can jump in a lot, which is fun. Yeah, um, government has put five five billion dollars for the EV charging infrastructure. Five billion. Nice. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, I think you you had a great pitch here. Um, you have a lot going on. Two hundred thousand users is really good. So, um, let's go to Jonas. Yes, perfectly. Um, let me share my screen shortly. Um, so, hello, I'm Jonas Fanas, part of the Amygdalas. We're defining the stock lending market. Um, we had our stocks laying around for years, um, searching for better usage of the holding time. Therefore, we spent over 20 years developing our stock lending solution, which is safer, transparent, more accessible. With extensive customer validation and last six financial expos, we're now ready to scale our solution and partner to increase our lending volume. My co-founders have individually up to 25 years of experience in stock trading, CFDs, consulting, and financial product development. Together, we identified the current stock lending market has high entry barriers, up to $100,000. You have significant loss potential of 100% with untransparent risk, and it's good towards brokers, which take up to 85% of lending fees generated. Therefore, 201 million Americans are holding shares, in average 5.5 months, and are not considering lending their shares in the current market. We developed a simple process that generates lending fees of 8.3% per year and are automatically reinvested into more shares. For one client, for example, 500 Intel shares in one quarter can grow to 505 by just taking the lending fees and reinvest them. We are currently having around 2 million share volume lent to us and generated around 16% return rate last year to pay out the lending fees and live from our surplus. And now we're offering 50% of our equity in the amygdalos to go into the market to scale and mainly for the setup, the legal cost, but also for the partnerships with the financial advisors to collect 12 million share value in the next two years. Thank you for your attention. I would love to talk more to you. Awesome. What investor questions do we have? Awesome. Do you have anything extra you want to add? Um, just that the lending market, if you look at current solution, um, mostly it's you lend, for example, to Robinhood, um, they're lending it out to a hedge fund with short selling or other markets. And what we're doing is one person is lending directly to us, which just using differences or arbitrage, and the same shares are maintained. Um, therefore, there's a lower risk profile. But I think there's one question now, Casey. Yep, I see Casey's hand up. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, curious about this from, um, uh, I guess, a, a geographical standpoint. What uh, what would allow you to uh, maybe regulate uh, regulatory wise uh, thrive in say the European and then the U.S. and Canadian markets? And and what are the big differences currently that you can see in terms of, uh, I guess, being able to uh, be adopted? Yes. Um, so in Germany, since nineteen ninety, um, it's allowed to lend out shares. Um, but in Germany, you need two years of bank regulation or managing experience to scale the company. Um, therefore, we are more focusing on the US, um, where we get a license seven as allowance. And we have interest from Cambridge right now as financial advisors to sell our product. Um, so the focus is in the US and get a license seven in the next quarter or next two quarters and then be able to offer our service directly through financial advisors. 
Great, appreciate awesome. that. I'll, uh, I'll follow up with you. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you, Jonas. Great pitch. Let's go to Adam H. Hey guys, uh, Jeremy, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm Adam Haber. I'm the co-founder of Trellis. Our website is buytrellis.com. Trellis is creating a billion dollar super app to help small businesses compete against corporate giants. We started our business in early 2021 by providing last mile logistics for small businesses using our proprietary software. And we are launching a shop local from home marketplace this spring. Helping small businesses is an untapped $73 billion market comprised of 10.2 million retailers that don't fit the Amazon, DoorDash, or UPS model. Trellis has significant traction. We have over 440 merchant partners. We're approaching 100,000 successful deliveries. We have a total revenue of over a million dollars to date. And currently we have $50,000 a month of reoccurring revenue we're growing. It's an absolutely massive white space opportunity we're going after. Our top notch team of 15 is excited about the Trellis marketplace because we will only be charging our merchants 10% of the sale and not ripping off merchants by charging the 25 to 40%. They must pay now to be part of an e-commerce marketplace. We only need a thousand marketplace orders a day to break even, and all our local delivery partners are eager to be driven new revenue at an affordable price point. At 10,000 marketplace orders a day, we're a billion dollar company. And down the road, we will provide bundled services that include insurance, web services, credit card processing, payroll, HR and gift cards, which are services our trusted merchant partners have told us they desperately need from a trusted source. The three co-founders are entrepreneurs who have success in starting a variety of businesses and our skill sets, our skill sets complement each other. The founders have over $2 million of their own skin in the game, and we're passionate about helping small businesses compete in an Amazon and big e-commerce dominated retail landscape. Our $4 million seed round has about 300 k left to close, and it's comprised of two VCs, a family office, and angel investors. I look forward to your questions and I've added my LinkedIn website and deck, uh, pitch deck to the uh, chat. So thank you very much. Awesome. Great pitch, Adam. Uh, a lot of great million dollar traction plus already investors. That's great. Uh, what investor questions do we have? Ryan, I, I don't remember. Okay, Ryan, yes. It, do you have the drivers or is this, um, you're also getting the drivers? So you have multiple we marketplaces. We have, uh, uh, we, we're, we're in New York Metro right now. We have well over 100 drivers in our network, the 1099 gig drivers. We have dozens more in the queue. We just want to make sure that they're busy when they get started. A good driver makes 300 bucks a day or more. Uh, we're using the same model as anybody else. And we expand that in New York Metro. We're going to use third-party apps to uh, help expand into areas. Our main focus was using this network to create a trusted uh, source, which is delivery. And then the marketplace is what's going to be highly profitable, driving orders to small businesses, uh, and you can get something delivered in a one to four hour time frame, except hot food. They're all extremely excited about. Awesome. And then we have uh, Phil, you have a question. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Adam. I, I mean, I certainly get the um, problem you're solving for vendors that want to list on the platform. Um, What's, what makes it attractive for customers? What's going to attract them away from Amazon and decide that they'd rather shop with you? The value add is time. Uh, you can always find something cheaper on a website if you want to wait a day or two. We're not really dealing with commodity items. A lot of them are specialty retailers like clothes and toys, gift baskets, chocolate, stuff like that. Uh, and if you need something last minute, the idea came from when I was commuting to the city and I had to get a toy for a birthday party and there was no way for me to click a button and get something to my house in an hour or two from a store I already knew and love. And there's unlimited opportunity and nobody's going after this space. And people want to shop locally, they just need a value add and the value add, the value add is time. Okay. Awesome, great pitch. Uh, let's go next to Emily R. Hey everyone, very inspired by everyone. All wonderful pitches. Um, and thank you as well for the invite, Jeremy. Um, so everyone, I'm Emily Rose Delara. I'm the co-founder of Payant. Um, I've had to chase invoices and deal with cash flow issues as a result of clients paying months too late or worse, running out of cash to pay their team and me for my entire career in tech. Um, I've spent the last 15 years working as a marketer in tech and Web3, where the late payments occurred most frequently, and not just for me, but my teams and vendors as well. During my time as head of marketing and CMO 
in multiple different Asian exchanges, I met my co-founder Antoine, who has six years experience in building products, customer support teams, and building blockchain products for B2C. And he helped me to take the problem I was facing, being paid late or not at all. And we created a solution that secures payments without the need for trust or a third party. So this allows freelancers and agencies to invoice via our platform, receive deposits or the full amount into a smart contract. And then once all the criteria is met, it's then deposited to their wallet. Now, every invoice is on the blockchain and both client and customer are protected by a three-tier dispute resolution service. Right now, we are crypto only, but next up on the roadmap is Fiat OnRamp and card payments, so anyone can use the platform. We have 300 people on the wait list and three agencies lined up to use us for their payments. Um, our model is a tiered subscription between $25 to $90 per month with varying support and features. We're currently MVP um, in a soft launch testing all the time. And we're looking for 20,000 to 50,000 to go to market, add fear on ramp and privacy to our invoices and to reach our goal of a thousand active users by end of the year to take us to a predicted profitability by the end of 2024. Thank you, Emily. What investor questions do we have? And if um, none, that is fine. Amira, do we have a question? Yes. Um, maybe this question sounds a bit dumb, but like, um, how is this different from PayPal, except that this is on blockchain? Oh, that's a really good question. So the difference between PayPal and other freelancing websites like Fiverr, for example, is that their um, escrow solution effectively is built on trust and favors those who are paying the fees, right? So they have to be their fate, basically, of who, who gets the, the money if they don't do the work is dependent on a third party and it's dependent on their platform. Whereas here, because we use a blockchain and smart contracts, we're taking away that trust. So it's only based on criteria and we don't favor either party and the funds are not kept by a third party either. So then it's based on the blockchain. It's, uh, I'm trying to not make it complex here. It's much more safe and it's more in their hands. Awesome. Uh, thank you for your answer. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go next to Sal. Good morning, everybody. Uh, our company is Dude Meds. We provide patients with prescription medications like testosterone and Ozempic, amongst others, uh, across all 50 states via telemedicine. Because let's be honest, most of America is fat, weak, and limp. I'm Sal Plato. I've spent over a decade and a half um, in the health and pharmaceutical industries with the last seven years focused on telemedicine and pharmaceutical sales. And I'm Jonathan Hancock. I've spent the last 14 years building a private multi-specialty practice, and I'm currently in the process of an exit. Sal and I met while we we're both completing our doctorate degrees. Along the way, we brought on Brian Angelette. He's a former longtime Verizon executive and former chief media officer for DraftKings. He has helped carve out and curate our dude meds go-to-market strategy. Together, we identified a need for a digital health company with a bold attitude and otherwise sterile telemedicine environment. We are immediately targeting a huge undertap potential in 11 separate multi-billion dollar markets in the U.S. alone. So our, our team has proven industry leadership, right? mass marketing, direct to consumer experience, combined with a tech driven product that's built for scale, which, put, which puts dude meds in a position to uh, have explosive growth and, and market share gain. We soft launched dude meds only 14 days ago uh, with limited product offerings and we rocketed into the telemedicine stratosphere. We haven't spent a dime on ads, barely dipped our toes in SEO, and yet paying patients all across the nation have already purchased meds from us, which is really, really cool. This organic uh, immediate traction confirms our product market fit, and we're hungry to unleash it to uh, unleash it further. So how we win, right? It's in our name. Segmentation of the market, having a strong brand and attitude, innovative pricing model, and a focused, targeted influencer go-to-market. $10 million is our fuel injection ask, powering an explosive go-to-market strategy and solidifying our scalable infrastructure. 
with this boost will capture a monumental market share, leaving competitors in our dust and our investors happy. We know what it takes to grow a business from scratch, and we have the grit, determination, and the drive to make it happen. Our ask is for the opportunity for secondary meetings with you guys and to do some due diligence. DudeMeds.com. Check us out. Love it. Great pitch. What investor questions do we have? Casey. Uh, what What's the extent of your product offering right now? And where do you want it to be in, say, one or two years? Uh, one or two years. We want to – our extent is we have essentially 11 different segments right now. Um, primary care is a massive, massive market, and that's, that's an undertapped area. Um, honestly, it's not very difficult for us to – onboard new medications, right? We have a vast expansive network of, of doctors across all 50 states. So we can roll out things as they come, new products, right? The, the Ozempic semaglutide craze right now, we can jump on and any new of those pain trains immediately. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, Jeff Levin, I see every hand raised. Yeah, um, awesome pitch guys. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your uh, distribution network and your plans for that as well? So distribution network, we have one of the largest telemedicine pharmacies, uh, tech friendly in the nation. Um, they do thousands and thousands of scripts daily. You can't even get in with them if you don't have a built out, built out back end. So we're in with them. That's like almost an invite only. So that was really good. We're in with those guys. Um, we also are other strategic partners for logistics, our at home labs, right? We're, we're partnered with guys, um, two time Y Combinator, um, back businesses, uh, with labs, pharmacy, and our physician network, it's nationwide physician network. And we are the only ones in the nation right now piloting with a nationwide approach for testosterone, which is a controlled substance, right? No one's dipped their toe yet in that industry. You know, our big competitors that are out there, they have shied away from that. We're forging ahead, uh, forging ahead on that. Awesome. Thank you for that. I see Phil has a hand quite uh, raised, but we'll, it looks like we're only having time for two investor questions. So um, Phil will have to Phil will connect with you guys in the comments or afterwards. Uh, let's go next to uh, Katya. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy, and to all esteemed investors for this great opportunity. I'm going to share my screen. We'd like to tell our story. This is the view from my office at the pinnacle of my career as CEO of one of the world's largest law firms. The next day, I faced redundancy. My personal rock bottom ignited a quest to unlock my greatest potential. And it turned out that I wasn't alone. I realized I tapped into a social movement where businesses and individuals alike were using coaching to reach their greatest potential. And they were right. Recent studies show that a 35 increase in profits and an 8x return for companies and employees. And with a $500 billion TAM in leadership development and HR having the number one priority of leadership development in 2024, we tapped into a gold mine and made it scalable. Viveka is an innovative coaching platform designed to unlock human potential in corporations. With over 20,000 coaches in our marketplace, and our three-way SaaS solution is capable of delivering fully automated and seamless high-volume coaching engagements across the largest organizations. Our industry-leading team comprises executives in talent management, software go-to-market, strategic client fulfillment, technology development, including senior vice president Corn Ferry, CIO Unilever, and recently added managing director learning and development of Deloitte. Since going to market in 2023, our strategic partnership with industry giant SHL, the world leading psychometric assessment provider, added a gross pipeline of over 200 million with an average deal size of 15 million. The partnership brings 130 global sales reps representing our products globally. With your investment, we'll accelerate go-to-market growth, expanding our sales team and tech support, investing in AI, and a, mobile and a mobile app. Join us in unlocking human potential. Thank you for your consideration. Amazing pitch, Kaya. Stacked team um, and pipeline clients. Uh, what what investor questions do we have, Casey? 
Katya, good to see you again. Um, very curious in terms of how you roll out the your uh, how the coaching is rolled out. Is it done one on one in small groups and cohorts? Um, what's the uh, approach, I guess, to maximizing uh, uh, the opportunity there? Yeah, absolutely. We have stand up product offerings, so we have three main categories: lead, grow, and retain. Very much aligned with. Uh, or HR priorities right now. So leadership development, growth focuses on succession planning and employee experience from the retention point of view. We have 20 leadership and skill training um, offerings as well as 30 personal development offerings. Excellent, thank you. Awesome. Um, looks like no other questions and we're right about at the minute. Great pitch, Katya. Um, as always, the recording will go out to a ton of other investors and other people may follow up with you after the call. Um, thank you. Thank you, Katya. Thank you. Next up, we have Hania. Correct me if I said that wrong. If you are here. Yes, I am. Yes. Awesome. There we go. We can. Okay. Uh, I am my my name is Hania. I am an aerospace engineer, and I I've been I've dream I've dreamed of flying fast since I was six years old. Um, as an aerospace engineer, I've worked in some of the world's top aerospace companies, working on cutting edge projects, uh, including uh, including the aircraft, which is the most advanced technical aircraft in the world right now. But I was very disappointed that I, I can't book a flight on, on, on a supersonic aircraft. We, we are in 2024. Um, so in 2019, I met Johan, my, my co-founder. And ever since we, we met, we would often discuss how we can solve this. Johan already has experience, uh, more than a decade's experience of working on ultra lightweight composite materials. He has led teams with 100 plus years of experience and he secured multi-million investments from eight major banks. So following those discussions in 2022, we believe we, we found the solution and immediately started building prototypes. We are now on our seventh prototype and have already achieved the weight targets for supersonic and to go uh, and, and to demonstrate vertical uh, takeoff flight. Uh, the prototypes are two meter by one meter long and they weigh only 250 grams. So less less than what a, maybe a gl glass of water would, would, would weigh, um, including the electronics structures and all the other payload. Right now we are raising 90,000 pounds to take our aircraft to the edge of space and break, break the electric aircraft speed record um, in first 90 days. And then finally, take the lessons learned from, from that to go supersonic before the end of the year. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Um, what investor questions do we have? I will ask, um, what do you, what, do you have any comments on uh, monetization timeline? I don't know if I heard that or not. Sorry, mon monetization? Yep. Um, how, okay. how, are you, how, uh, how am I funding it? How are you going to make money when any, anything around that? Yes. So uh, I've already started working on this from smaller scale. The plan is to have uh, a drone kit that I could sell to um, to drone drone shops, and I already have interest from about twenty people in in one day since I posted. So they, they want to buy the kits, which are, are going to be about two hundred pounds each, and then I could uh, because both Johan and I have, are experts in in our field, we could run courses uh, to teach carbon fiber manufacturing. Um, and then uh, we, we, yeah, once once the demonstrator is complete, we could take payloads to the edge of space uh, from different organizations who would 
like to monitor areas or have, have a satellite in the orbit, etc. Until we, we achieve the supersonic aircraft uh, for um, passengers. So all, all of these money funnels would invest into that end goal. Awesome. Thank you, Hania. Great pitch. Thank you. Next up, we have Maxine. Thanks, Jeremy. Gonna share my screen. Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxine. I'm an investment banker turned economist turned the CEO of Pick My Brain. And after having 2,000 conversations using Pick My Brain and making a few hundred thousand dollars selling my knowledge, I am the belief that knowledge commerce is going to be the new e-commerce. Oh. oh, sorry. Hold on a sec. There we go. There we go. Um, the problem is, is that it's still so much easier to sell products online than it is to sell knowledge, which is um, allowing us to buy more products and sell more knowledge. Um, in order to fix this, I built a solution that makes it really easy for people and companies to buy, sell, and gift knowledge uh, via the click of a button. Think Shopify, uh, but for knowledge. Um, ultimately, this takes people and companies um, and um, groups of people who are otherwise inavailable and unaccessible um, and making them instantly available and accessible, just like, again, Shopify did for so many vendors. Uh, we started B2C for the first three years, attracted 1,000 brains from over 88 countries, facilitated 10,000 bookings, and unlocked just over a million dollars of sales. Um, then we decided um, to go B2B and build marketplaces as a service for communities with thousands of people. Um, this is when things started to really blow up for us. Um, and in less than three months, we landed our first multi-million dollar deal with a company called Junior Achievement. Um, just to give you an idea of this deal, there's 85 million teachers in the world. And we had an idea is what if we gave all those teachers the opportunity to bring in any professional into the classroom for a conversation via the click of a button. Um, so we're building out this marketplace for this company to achieve that starting in my home province in BC. And then uh, they're in 110 countries. It's a company that's been around for 100 years to scale the solution into what I think is going to be the future of education. Um, the B2B market is massive. We have over 30 warm B2B um, leads in our pipeline uh, that reach over 10 million dollars or 10 million people rather of people looking to build marketplaces as a service for their communities. Um, so this is definitely our go-to market focus. Um, we're looking to onboard our first 10 deals this year um, and scale that to 100. Um, we've got the perfect team to do it. Um, uh, we can whip up marketplaces in less than a day thanks to our CTO, Yev, who's on the call. We've got a CRO who's closed $200 million in enterprise sales at helping us close a B2B um, and a customer support person who's helping um, those B2B deals uh, be successful. We also have a group of strategic advisors who are feeding us deals. Um, who have a ton of experience. Uh, and these are our next milestones. So a million ARR by June, 2024, three by 2025 and 10 by 2026. And we are currently raising a $2 million round at $10 million valuation, um, focused on spending that both on team marketing and potentially acquisitions. Um, if you are interested in connecting with me, feel free to go to www.pickmybrain.world and um, search for Maxine and, and give the platform a whirl and feel free to book me for a call. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, Maxine. And we have about one minute for questions. So I uh, see Casey, go ahead. Maxine, appreciate the presentation and also saw that you were in the uh, Vancouver area. So we'd love to catch up sometime. Um, mm -hmm. Curious as to how you're acquiring um, people for the platform. Are these people that have their courses already set and then you're just repurposing them or are they creating something for you when you um, uh, meet them? Uh, so not course-based. So everyone on Pick My Brain can be booked one-on-one -on -one for things like Pick My Brain calls, coffee and conversations, or um, three-month mentorship packages, not, not online courses. So it's live. Um, the, the, on the B2C side, uh, we have just attracted people via word of mouth. Um, and then on the B2B side, actually all of our B2B leads have come from the B2C side. Um, now that we've said that we can build marketplaces as a service for other communities. Um, so that's been, that's, that's, that's where we're at so far. Excellent. Uh, appreciate the clarification too. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and we have time for that one. So I see Phil's hands raised, but that will have to be, uh, yeah, we'll get that one to the comments for afterwards. Um, Phil can ask Maxine that. Uh, next up, we have Greg. Sorry, Phil. Thanks, Jeremy, and buckle up. 
Hi, I'm Greg Hodgen, and I'm tired of watching the world burn. I spent more than a decade working for an international nonprofit that dealt with forcibly displaced people, and I realized that the only way to truly help them was to help all of humanity. We need cheap energy, and we need to stop climate change. I'm crazy enough to try, and to my pleasant surprise, I actually found fellow crazies, uh, Colonel Emmett Spurlock, who advised the Joint Chiefs of Staff and knocked out a Harvard Business degree, along with Dr. Athena Ivanov, who's got an MD, a PhD in quantum chemistry, and just finished a NASA fellowship, and uh, Alex Dolce, our legal expert with specialty in contracts and space law, which, by the way, is actually a real thing. We've also assembled several teams of scientists all over the country with expertise from electrical engineering to nuclear fusion. We're using a quantum hack with nanoscopic space-time distortion technology to create a microfusion reactor about the size of a kitchen table that produces a terawatt of power and that can run on water. Our ask is $45 million to finish proof of concept, lock down patents, and begin building our lab. I hope you're crazy enough to join us. Not only can this technology give us zero carbon power for our civilization, it can also give humanity the stars. I'm going to ask uh, what investor questions, uh, but given the R&D of this project, it's uh, really interesting. So uh, what, what, are, what questions do you have for investors, from investors? Yeah, that's awesome. crazy. <laughs> It is also, I mean, you have a really, I mean, I've, I've chatted with you before and you have a really um, sophisticated and built out team globally. So um, it's, it's, it is something that I wouldn't be able to necessarily ask um, deep questions on anyway, either. It's, it's, it's where, it's, it's where any VCs like us, we have to go and find, um, you know, PhD people to help, help um, ask those questions. Right. And then we get to ask generalized theoretical questions, people, science questions, et cetera. So um, I think great pitch. Um uh, and so this, this recording will be sent out to other investors as well. And so awesome. Thank you very much. Awesome on that. Um, 48, two minutes until the next one. So, uh, before I go to the next one, um, I would just recap a little bit, um, because people are in and out of these videos. Um, Esther, my co-founder and I, we're building the world's largest investor and founder network. We're running these super founder pitch events, two minute pitch, two minute QA vendors, pitch founders, Founders pitch uh, investors. We're building defensible pitch events, just like there's a defensible uh, company and there's defensible people. There's also defensible pitch events, which means a defensible pitch event is more capital at the table, 20, 20 or so investors on the panel, plus thousands essentially over time uh, in the network so that every time um, founders pitch for two minutes, they know that um, over time as we build up the network, their two minute slice or four minute slice technically with the Q&A will go out to investors and we will have that distributed through software so that your stage and size can go to particular investors and they can actually just see exactly what they want. Um, so some of what the investors showing up today, they might be seeing founders that are not in their investment thesis pitch. Um, but part of them being here today is uh, they get they get visibility because every investor always needs deal flow. So they get visibility in front of high quality deal flow and on the graphic as we share that around. Um, and then the other benefit is like over time, they're just going to, even when they don't show up, they're going to get um, other uh, of the pitches sent out. So um, we have built this for essentially global scale. We have globally investors and founders here. So some people it was like uh, 6 a.m. this morning on uh, uh, San Francisco kind of time, uh, but it's also midnight for some other people. We have Australia, we have Singapore, we have Dubai, we have Pakistan. We have a lot of different countries than uh, all over Europe and UK, uh, US, Canada on the call. So uh, this is a fun for event for me. Uh, I live for these things 24-7. Um, so I'm obsessed with founder mentoring because high quality, high scale founders is the bottleneck in the world at scale. When founders are, uh, investors are looking at investing in power law, um, finding there's a deep science in finding and also up leveling, uh, founders. And so that's what we're diving into. So next up we have Smiranda and correct me if I said that wrong. Hey. Yes, I can hear you just a little bit of latency. Hey. No, the audio is not clear. I see you and I hear just a little bit of audio, but it's gargled. Is this better? This is working. Yes, I can hear that. So this is a, this, you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So hello, I'm Saranda Young. We have a clean tech startup, a composite recycling. We're all passionate about the sea and we all love sailing. So we quickly, we quickly realized that sailing boats, which are made of composites with outstanding material properties in terms of mechanical resistance, and lightweight, were designed for durability and they were not designed to be recycled. So today their disposal is a significant challenge for both environment and the public health. 
Uh, most boats are abandoned in ports. They pollute our water ecosystems with microplastics. And uh, if they are incinerated, they release CO2 emissions and toxic gases that we breathe. Um, and if they are landfilled, they contaminate our soils. So this is a big, big problem today. And to address this urgency of composite waste, um, which is a big number, it, in only Europe it's projected to reach 1.2 million tons in 2030. We have developed a solution based on paralysis to efficiently separate the glass fibers from the resins. Our management team consists of three persons with a total of 70 years of re relevant experience across composites, uh, shipbuilding, industries, paralysis, finance, and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have all made really nice careers uh, before building the startups. Uh, for example, I was at UBS, I was at PICTE, and my colleagues were working for Ford Motors uh, and for the renowned uh, technical University um, um, uh, in Lausanne, in Switzerland. So today we have two, about two and a half years since foundation. We've engineered the technology. We've conducted more than 350 paralysis tests. We have signed 10 strategic partnerships. And now we have a list of more than 30 paying clients. And among these are multi-billion dollar companies across different industry, uh, not only marine, but also in aerospace, transportation, and wind turbines, which proves the viability of our approach. Our first large-scale reactor will become operational this summer, 2024, and we're looking to raise a total of $5 million over the next 12 months to scale up our business through four additional mobile units, each projected to treat 1,000 tons of composite waste per year, which will result in, in almost 7,000 tons of CO2 savings in 2026. So from our initial revenues that were only 100,000 made the, over the last few months, we forecast sales of 2.3 million in 2025, and 7 million in 2026. Our margins are above 40%, between 40 and 50%, and we expect to become break even in the next 18 months. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. Um, great pitch. Uh, great that you're a former UBS. Um, looks like we went into the question time as well. That was four minutes, so but still great pitch. Um, next up, we will go to James. Any investors that have questions for you, they can ask in the comments or reach out afterwards. James M. Next. Thank you. Hi, I'm James Martin, founder and CEO of Easy Clinic. My grandmother died in an ICU because gaps in patient monitoring left nurses unaware she, she needed life-saving care. Aided by government-sponsored research and my wife, an ICU physician, I've fully dedicated three years to understanding these gaps. My co-founders and I pooled our business and tech backgrounds to address this. For 10 years, I've led operations in medtech R&D and founded a telemedicine practice. For 11 years, Quinn, our CTO, has pioneered computer vision-based industrial and me medical AI applications with his acquired startup Paracosm and Philips Healthcare. For 14 years, Dr. Webby, who holds an, a medical degree and a PhD in informatics, has led 136 medical AI projects as Northwestern University's Chief Research Information Officer and was the inaugural medical director of their Center for AI. We've identified the gaps in patient monitoring that are caused by tasks that take ICU nurses away from patients 40% of the day. That's, that annually leads to more than 700,000 deaths and $1.5 trillion in health care costs just in the U.S. alone. To fill these gaps, our SAS AI utilizes computer vision and vital data analysis to monitor patients and predict medical emergencies, ensuring nurses know when to prevent harm. We're collaborating with physician research teams at Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and Old Dominion University to generate and validate our unique data and algorithms. We're raising 1.5 million to accelerate expanding our sales team and advancing our clinical partnerships into seven paid pilots worth 6.1 million annual recurring revenue within nine months. Please connect to learn more about our proprietary advantages 
and plans to expand our focus from a $67 billion obtainable market to one valued at $310 billion. Join us as we create a future where no life is lost simply because nurses are needed elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, James. What investor questions do we have? Do you have anything else you want to add, Moses? Not that you have to. Uh, nothing, totally fine. You know. <laughs> uh, just, nothing. Yeah. No, nothing that's not proprietary at this point. At this point. Yep. Cool. Sounds cool. good. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Great pitch. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Ahamodor. I know I probably messed that up, but if you can correct me, I would love to learn. Perfect. No, that's, it's Amador. So just to introduce myself, my name's Amador Chowdhury. I'm a doctor by background and a content creator. To be specific, I'm a health and life sciences podcaster, and it's grown to the top 2.5% globally with over 100,000 listens. Now, over the last decade, I've done deep research into understanding how we share our knowledge and experiences. But over the last five years, we've all witnessed a new movement that I've too been a part of. And that's the rise of the modern day content creator. We're all creators here. Now, along the way, I've got my co-founder, Dr. Abdul, who joins me with experience in marketplaces. Whilst I've also got a pharmaceutical expert, Dr. Malcolm Barrett Johnson, who has over 20 years of industry experience, particularly in regulations, joining us. Now we realize the health and life sciences industry is disjointed. The pharmaceutical industry have a pressing need to connect with senior healthcare professionals, but regulations stifle them. Meanwhile, we've got healthcare professionals who want to be connected for growth, for opportunities, for branding, for monetization, just like the modern day creator, but they've been left behind. So what we've done is we've built a regulatory safe platform for healthcare professionals in the industry to share any type of content themselves to grow their brand and to grow an engaged audience that they can tap into. And unlike other platforms on our platform, it's safe for collaborations to take place. The pharma marketing opportunity is worth 250 billion, which is our wedge in. And as communities form, we enter research and development and data, which is worth over 400 billion. Since pivoting a year ago, we have over 4,000 healthcare professionals, over 10,000 monthly reads, and over 700 minutes of coaching taking place on our platform. 25 businesses are on board, ranging from small startups to scale-ups to large corporations, including KPMG and YouTube Health. We are raising a 300,000 pre-seed for an 18-month runway to expand the team, to accelerate product de development, and to hit a one million pound ARR serving three pharma companies that we are negotiating with to secure a strong future revenue runway. Thank you for listening. Thank you. What questions do we have? What investor questions do we have? Okay, awesome. Yeah, we just may not have investors that have the questions either right away or 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 investment thesis fit, and that is totally fine. And we will send this out to the investors afterwards. Um, and some of them may just want to connect to you for deeper questions anyway, because sometimes questions are just very very. Um, it's hard to find brief ones when it's like, oh, I have a I have a big question that's not going to fit in a minute or two. So that's that's what's going to happen to a lot of founders today as well. Um, is sometimes the question is just actually a much more deeper one. So um, great pitch. Um, next up, we have Moses who I skipped. So Moses, if you want to go yeah. ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Moses. I'm the founder CEO of Bureau Care. Bureau Care is basically a way to democratize mental health and officials drive mental health to 100 million people around Africa. And I think consensus for Bureau Care is a state of society. One five people are also from the every year, which roughly amounts to and I think the best way to describe it is as the um, It is hard to hear you. I don't know if there's any adjustment or if it's just a network thing that we can't affix, but I want us to also be able to hear you. All right, now. Yeah. 
you could uh you could always try shutting off screen share to conserve some bandwidth maybe that give us a better audio quality and we can hear you okay okay sure. what about that can you hear me now much yeah, better right. yes all right, all right, all right. Thanks. So, so um, hi everyone. My name is Moses, and I'm founder and CEO of Blue Room Care. Blue Room Care is basically a way to democratize mental health, and our vision is to provide mental health to 100 million people around Africa. I think the context for why Blue Room Care exists is the state of our society. One in five people would suffer from a mental health issue every year, which roughly amounts to a billion people. And I think the best way to describe that is as a global disgrace. I've spent the last four years working as a salesman, making more than four billion dollars in ARR along the way I met my co-founder who has spent the last 10 years as an experienced therapist. Together we identified that help wasn't convenient or affordable enough for Africans. We decided to solve that by making it fast and easy to get. Blue Room Care offers multiple types of therapy via live video audio appointment or texting. We now have over a thousand customers and generating thirty thousand dollars. We are a bit we're a B2B to see company we work with the top four peers in Africa, such as Axe Ambassade, Reliance Leadway, and other 10 organizations. We are a team of nine backed by experienced advisors from BetterHelp. That is really our our, our exit strategy is to get acquired by BetterHelp. We're looking to raise hundred thousand dollars to accelerate a good market strategy and also impact ten thousand lives and also hit two hundred and fifty K in six months. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Moses. What investor questions do we have? Okay, awesome. Great pitch. Um, next up we have Pavel, and correct me if I said that wrong. No, that's completely correct. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Pavel. Um, I've been managing games communities up to seven and a half million players since I was 16. And my academic background is in political science. I noticed that in online games, players who stay for the longest time and those who spend the most money are very engaged in in-game politics and intrigues and diplomacy and planning and scheming. But all of these things happen outside of the games, usually on forums or in chat rooms or in Discord. So I've partnered with Julie, whom I've known for a decade, and we combined our complementary experience in large tech and media companies to create Northern Lights Entertainment. Uh, we're a game studio. We're 16 people now, and we have worked together for two and a half years as that tightly knit team of 16. We're currently working on our first game where we make politics playable and where we let players experiment with new forms of political governance. And if you live in the US or pretty much anywhere else in the world, you know that that's a big thing and we need political changes and people are basically dying to, to experiment with you know alternative forms of how political decisions get made. We launched the first version of the game last year in 2023, and our players are showing amazing retention rates and actually are contributing 100,000 euros to our ongoing seed round. Uh, we're oversubscribing that seed round right now. We've uh, surpassed our target of 1 million euros, and uh, we would love to partner with you as well. Uh, the objective of the round is for us to reach 100,000 players uh, by the end of 2024 and up to 4 million players by the end of 2025. Um, we also have confirmed post-seed investments so for our next round uh, from Menlo Ventures, among other funds. And uh, it would be amazing to, to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. What? Yep. Uh, Ryan, we have a question. How do you monetize? Uh, so we, it's a it's a mobile game with in-app purchases uh, inside. It's not pay to win, so we monetize skins and quality of life uh, purchases, and we have already validated that uh, model by basically pre-selling the stuff that is going to be made available um, in the game to our players. We're at about sixty thousand euros in revenue for the last fiscal year, if that clarifies. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, any other, let's see what time are we at level four? What other questions do we have? Cool. Awesome. Great pitch. Um, this will be sent out to other investors as well. So awesome. Thanks. Let's go next up. Um, we're a little early on the schedule, which is great. Um, I believe we have Arif and or Vulcan next. Hello, everyone. I'm Arif and my partner, Volkan, here. Hey, guys. We are co-founders of Auto Group. Um, 
we started our journey six years ago, uh, me and my partner. Um, we were tapping into a market that is very saturated and very boring, you know, tech accessories, mostly the cell phone cases. So we want to change this by adding a customization, you know, feature onto it. So people, like we are talking about D2C market, people can come and, you know, put their, you know, memories, they can put their, you know, lifestyle images, and then they can uh, transform their memories into a product that they can carry along with them. So we start to make this journey with changing the market by offering customization and personalization on it. So we are going so far very good. We have $652,000 sales last year and lifetime $4.8 million revenue. Uh, in our database, we have 350, more than 350 B2B customers and more than $10,000 D2C clients in our database. So as you can understand, we do B2B and we have D2C operations. Currently we are looking for $500,000 uh, capital and then we are gonna use it towards our expanding our tech team and marketing team. We also want to increase our D2C market share. And also we are working on our own proprietary um, AI driven customization app. So the first version is already all live. We are generating revenue out of it. So we are like going further on this. And then on the other hand, we have another project which is kind of automated user-friendly laser engraving project. And with this project, we are trying to tap into carriers retail stores, just like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. So we have some deals on the table right now. We are going you know, forward on this. So the capital that we are gonna raise will be used towards those. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, we are here to take them. Awesome. What investor questions do we have? Okay. Do you guys have anything else you guys want to add as extra? We want the POD that like, we're working with the companies right now because our monetization system also I can quickly add, like uh, explain a little bit about this. So we are coming up with the AI system that actually we have a team overseas, like, you know, 13 of like in our professional teams, they're working on the AI system. So AI system will be monitored. We'll be connecting with the different POD companies and also like uh, to actually in order to get the sales, I mean, in order to get the connect to the systems. So that way we can, uh, we can go ahead and just, you know, disrupt the market. That's how we are planning. So we are we are almost 15 years and experience in the market and we are actually looking for the expansion of our business with the professional people like you guys thank you awesome. hi i'm awesome. hello i'm ramana i'm from founders club i'm with taha um i have a couple of questions for you uh arif and team uh, which markets are you currently present in is the first question. Second is, where is the revenue that you're generating uh, or that you have generated to date come from? If you could just give us a bit of a breakdown. Um, and, and then where is the company held right now? Yeah, absolutely. We are located in the United States, Florida, South Florida, uh, Miami area. Um, we have B2B and D2C operations. Um, again, they are you know mostly in the United States. Our D2C operation is global. Um, we have our website, we do, uh, you know, direct to consumer operation in B2B network. Mostly our customers are the retail store owners, just like cell phone store operators, card kiosk owners in the malls, which are, you know, interested in tech accessories like um, cell phones, batteries, um, you know, the chargers. Uh, but we are adding the value by offering the personalization design customization onto that. So we are getting out of the market by not offering regular, you know, very boring, random products. Okay, sorry. And the breakdown of revenue to date, where is that revenue that you described? I think it was $604 million, did you say? Where is that come from or been generated from? Yeah, sure. $652,000 from last year. 60% is B2B, 40% from D2C. And um, it's the same breakdown for the lifetime uh, revenue, $4.8 million. We are in market, we are in business for six years. 
So it's the same, 60% from B2B and 40% from D2C, See? which we want which to we increase want to... our D2C market share. And, and what has been the year-on-year -year growth of that? Uh, we are 15% growth yearly. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Awesome, great questions. Next up, uh, a little bit early on the schedule, which is good. Um, next up, we have Zishan. And correct me if I said that wrong. Hi, thank Jeremy. Th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, greetings, everyone. I am Zishan Shamsi. Um, I'm the uh, founder CEO of Z Minerals. I stumbled upon Pakistan's copper potential in 2016 in uh, the most unlikely of uh, places in uh, Santiago, Chile, where I was doing an aerospace project. Uh, the Tethyan mineral belt passing through the regions of Pakistan remains uh, largely unexplored, uh, emerged as a prime location for copper, gold, and uh, other precious metals. Over the last six years, I've uh, harnessed my technology expertise and adventurous spirit to explore and uncover the incredible mineral reserves within the Tethyan zones, which overall is worth $3 trillion or more and remains crucial for powering the future of green technologies and the EV revolution. The uh, global appetite for copper is insatiable. It's an $8 billion market uh, uh, back in 2022 and 23. And with the imminent surge in demand due to the green energy transition, traditional mine development timelines pose a significant challenge. Our solution is groundbreaking. We aim to revolutionize the industry by integrating artisanal mining seamlessly into key development stages from feasibility study to refining, drastically reducing the typical five to eight year timeline for mine production. Our dedicated team of 15 volunteers comprised of mining experts, marketing professionals, logistics specialists, processing refining experts, bring together the right mix needed to deliver to all stakeholders. With $20 million in firm orders for copper ore and an additional $100 million in potential orders lining up, our venture is poised for success. Now we are seeking a $10 million seed fund to kickstart our operation and redefine the future of mining. Join us at Z Minerals into this transformative journey towards sustainable resource development and unparalleled growth. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, what investor questions do we have? Okay, awesome. I know um, I had chatted with you a little bit before, and uh, yes, uh, I, I, I sent you. A, there's an there's an investor that's interested in um, mining generally, and so we have that um, going on in the background as well. So just not everybody has the same thesis. So um, this this video um, will go. To everyone else, yes. Sorry, um, Zishan, what is your expertise? Sorry, like um, and your experience. The uh, uh, great question. I uh, am a defense contractor and aerospace specialist. So I have uh, over 20 years experience working with aerospace clients and technology clients supporting uh, aerospace platforms, specifically aircraft, military aircraft and civil aircraft uh, across the region, Middle East, uh, Pakistan, uh, other clients, et cetera. And where are you based right now? I'm based in Pakistan, where all the mines are. Okay, Is, are you based in Islamabad? I'm based in Karachi. Okay. Our holding structure uh, though uh, okay. is interesting because we plan to have, uh, we already have a holding company based in United Kingdom, which is going to own uh, Z Minerals Private Limited, which is registered in Pakistan, which is in turn going to hold the assets, which we plan to do the, do the for the feasibility and development on while we integrate all the artisanal miners and generate revenue so being cash positive through the process instead of being cash negative, which are traditional junior miners and uh, uh, junior mining companies and exploration companies. This is how we're different. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys own uh, space in the Tatian uh, belt or are you guys basically acting as the middlemen? Excellent question. We have agreements in place to acquire uh, leases or properties that are in the Tethyan Belt, specifically two markets. One is Balochistan, where, of course, Barra Gold is, and going in with an $8 billion investment. 
and Gilgit Baltistan province in Pakistan, which is, is still pretty much unexplored and extremely rich when it comes to copper and precious metals as it as as it goes. So uh, we have agreements in place. We are requesting seed fund because we need to acquire these leases and these properties and start the development. Right. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, $20 million, I believe I heard uh, written commitments is awesome. Um, and I know you have an advisor uh, who also runs a venture studio and he's done $100 million marketing budgets. So, um, and is well connected in the space too. So that's, that's good just as an added piece um, that I, that I, so part of it I heard in the pitch and part of it I just knew prior from written communications that I had with all you guys, all, all of the founders. So awesome there. Um, thank you for that, Zishan. Next up, we have the last founder to pitch and then, uh, which is going to be Daniel or Yosh, I believe. And then we'll have Tord from Funding Stack Talk. And then we'll have, um, I believe Mark McNally uh, will be hopping on um, to talk as well. And then, and then we'll close out from there. So let's go up to the last founder, uh, Daniel or Yosh, if you are here. I'm here. Jeremy, oh. can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you for the opportunity, man. Great to meet everybody. Good morning. Good evening. My name is Dan Legman, based out of Boston, Mass. Um, our startup is called Part Runner. We're in the sexy industry of logistics. Uh, what we're doing is we're building a marketplace delivering big and bulky goods across Mexico and the United States. Uh, what's big and bulky? It's essentially anything that's heavy, non-uniform, and basically a, a large headache for our customers. Um, distribution's tough. The industry is fragmented and ripe for tech disruption. Um, how we do it, we connect companies, wholesale retailers and distributors to a network of hundreds of professional business delivery providers. That's right, we don't own any of our own vehicles or, or warehousing space. Um, our network provides last mile, middle mile services and we're growing rapidly. Last year we grew about two and a half times. Year over year we finished with 7 million annual uh, GMV revenue. We do over 4,000 routes per month. Last year alone, we did over 500,000 stops. Um, our, our ask for everybody here is we're raising the 500K bridge round, which is gonna go towards investing into our product and uh, sustainable growth across the Mexican market. Some of it's already committed, but I'd love to connect with anybody here who's interested in um, joining the journey. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Six million traction is amazing. Uh, what investor uh, questions do we have? Hi, Ramana here from Founders Club again. Uh, great pitch, Jeremy. Um, it sounds like a great platform. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, what is the percentage um, fee or commission that you're taking per transaction? Um, and then next markets or focus or, or priority for you? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so first one is we're averaging about 20% take rate. And the second question was, what is our market focus? Um, for 2024, it's going to be growing across Mexico, um specifically are there any global competitors that you're modeling the business on yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely uh, uh, there's a few there's in, a few uh, in uh, oh there's some background noise oh, okay uh there's a few in latam and there's a few in the u.s uh for example lift it is, is a pretty large uh competitor of ours in latin america based out of colombia uh we know the founders um but essentially those are they have similar models, similar frameworks to what we're doing. Um, we're just attacking it in, in a different way. Okay, thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Um, just because in the Middle East, this is a, is a significant problem. Um, I'm based out in the Middle East, um, and I'd be really interested to to kind of know if you've done any market research out here, um, and or if they'd be interested to to grow such a platform out here. Because I, I know it's it's definitely a current issue. We have trucker. Um, uh, which is worth you having a look at. Um, but I think that they they own some of their own vehicles, unlike you as a pure play marketplace. So so worth having a look at that. Yeah, thanks for the um, thanks for that. I'll look into them. And uh, right now, our our absolute focus is going to be on Mexico. Um, but yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I'll I'll definitely look into them. Thank you. Awesome. All righty. Thank you, Daniel. Great pitch. Uh, six million traction is great. It's great meeting you last night in uh, Boston too. So, um, next up, we we are done with the pitches. Now we have Tord. If he's on the call, um, he's going to talk about funding stack and maybe even his new company. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. He's going to chat for about five minutes. 
Um, so let's go toward if you were here. I'm here. Super. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for first of all putting me on here. And um, yeah, thank you all for pitching. This is incredible to hear. I really want to start start like from the beginning, you know, seeing that it is it is hard to raise capital, especially in this climate. We started a company, Funding Stack or Founder Suite, actually, six years ago with the whole intention of helping companies raise capital because we re realized it was hard to raise for our own race. So um, I'm just going to share my screen here so it's a little easier to uh, understand what, what we do as well. So there we go. Now you can probably see my screen. Yes. So seeing how hard it is to raise is capital these days. You go to multiple events, you can really find that ideal investors, you can spend up to a year and still be at the same place. We thought if there's an easier way of doing this, it must be having the resources come to you. Like having the investors actually in a curated database where you can filter and find investors based on those metrics as in investor type, you know, you're raising your, your seed round, for example, you want to raise $500,000. Then you can go to type, find that angels in um, whatever it is, family office and location, industry, to really niche down on those investors and only find the most relevant ones. So you don't have to, yeah, go all over the place and instead focus on finding, reaching out and yeah, actually closing the rounds. So that's been our our key key um focus the last co couple of years and actually building out this platform with a CRM so you can keep track. We nudge you every time there's a a uh, yeah, if you haven't followed up with those investors, um you can send emails directly through the platform itself. So really focus on where we were six months six years ago when we were trying to raise capital and seeing, okay, this is something we we were struggling with. So the team consists of Nathan Beckard and myself. Nathan has spent 30 years in investment banking. Myself, I really tried to raise capital for a Norwegian company when I started studying here in, in the US and went to Berkeley. Didn't happen. So I thought, okay, this is a very interesting problem because it affects all of us. So why isn't there any solutions to this? And that's brought, what's brought me in here today. We also help with the coaching part and the pitch deck process which Jeremy also discussed really shortly there which is the yeah how to actually get ready once you have the investors you have match made with the right people how can you actually leverage that and get ready for those meetings so I'm happy to join in on any you know um, conversations if you have any questions on fundraising for everything from pre-seed all the way to series A I'm happy to jump on and um so is Nathan, Nathan to um, share our yeah experience. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tord. Um, yeah, that was that's really amazing. That's why I wanted to uh, feature this here um, so that people know um, additional sources of of where and how they can get funding. Funding Stack is great, and and Tord, I know you launched your new company too, um, helping people with pitch decks and other things. So I think that's really really great, and that's why I wanted to give you that extra visibility here. So thank you for that. Uh, next up, we have um, Mark McNally. Uh, before I do Mark McNally, I'll just say um, Scott Ford, ex-CEO of Techstars, um, uh, is a sponsor of this event. He spoke at some of the last events, um, Super Founder events, and he is uh, he has a new startup called Zigzag. Um, you can uh, essentially say or write a sentence, and it will it will help you start up. It will launch up your, I believe, mission values. I'm not going to explain it really, really well. Um, I love, I love everything when he showed it to me um, and he's shown it at previous events. It's, it's really helpful. A lot of companies are going to get started and launched and scaled faster and faster in this world because there's more mentors in the world, because there's more software and tools to help, because there's more investor support, um, investor tools, funding stack, et cetera. Venture Studios is a massive thing, which Mark will talk about a little bit next about his Venture Studio. Um, so Scott Ford uh, and ZigZag is something to look into. Manoush uh, is also, Manoush and Studio Hub is also a sponsor of this event. Um, uh, something to also look into. Um, I am a studio and founder mentor there, a thousand plus studios worldwide. Um, studios is a big thing. It's a massive de-risk on the, on the founder journey. There is a Polynomial function essentially in every company um, on how on how 
people are hired and how they make their estimates and CTR and CVR rates of copy and, and problem difficulty size um, and studios uh, af quantifiably affect that um, polynomial math function that no, people aren't necessarily paying attention to behind the scenes. So, um, and, and maybe I'll talk a little bit at the end after Mark McNally too, about how I see uh, founders and quality and scaling companies things. So uh, Manoush is a sponsor. Scott Ford is a, part, um, a sponsor. Uh, Raya Skoglen, she's invested in 80 plus startups. She's also on the investor graphic um, of the visionaryvc.com. You guys can check that out. Um, Raya has spoke at some of the last events. She's amazing as well. Um, now we will have Mark. He's going to chat uh, five, 10 minutes. Take whatever time you want, Mark. It's just you and then me next. Um, so take whatever time you want, five, 10 minutes. Uh, he, Mark McNally, he's had $5 billion in exits. Um, he is the CEO of Nobody Studios, one of the largest venture studios in the world, Facebook and Coca-Cola advisors, um, and really great human. So Mark, whatever you want to talk about, I would love to let you do that. Thanks, Jeremy. Awesome event as always, man. I'm loving the pitch series. Let's keep those going. Those are, that's a lot to learn from, so... Appreciate that. Yeah, as Jeremy said, I'm founder of Nobody Studios. We've got a gnarly goal to do 100 companies in five years. So look us up. Uh, always open door. Feel free to reach out. We love talking about this stuff. Um, yeah, Jeremy, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about pitching. I was kind of reflecting about some of the mentorship I tend to give over the years to, to young founders and entrepreneurs. Um, and it kind of breaks down into three things. Um, I, I tell people, first of all, unless you're really seasoned and have been through as many scars as I have, most people, I think, walk into the fundraising process kind of like a lot of people dream of walking into Hollywood, right? You think you're going to be like discovered in a Starbucks line and some like agent walks up to you and says, Oh my God, you've got the perfect face. You believe you belong in the movies. Um, and you think VCs are going to be the same way. Like you walk in with your, your cool little idea you've been thinking about for a while and you get through your decks and the VC stands up and goes, Oh my God, I love this. We got to do this. Don't leave. And they go get their checkbook. Right. So I'm here to like bust that myth. That happens absolutely never, um, except for a few times you see on Netflix or a movie or somewhere. 99.999% um, of the rest of us have to hustle our freaking rears off. So if you're not ready for that, then go ahead and just like go get the attitude reset and meditate because I think the right mental model of how this plays out is super, super important to, to pitching. You're likely going to get through you know, 50 to 100 or 200 pitches before you get to the person who's your the right person. And it's actually the process that gets you there. So you also have to embrace the process. You can't walk away from every single pitch that doesn't go your way. And you're going to mess things up, man. I messed up plenty of pitches with probably the right investor, but it didn't come out right. Or we weren't on our game. Like, that's okay. You know, there is a certain amount that you have to understand that there's a, there's a numbers game here. Um, and that, that translates into like one thing I think a lot of people don't understand is they think on the surface, I'm talking to a venture capitalist, okay, this person writes checks for companies, they have money. So if they don't give it to me, then I didn't do my job or my idea is bad, right? And you have to like peel back the onion is so much more complex than that. So if you someone told me young in my pitching career that really helped me, so I'll patch it on here, that the average VC looks at about 300 deals a year. So think about that, 300 deals a year. And what they're going to probably do is narrow that down to about 20 they're excited about. So look at the numbers there. You just had a 92% or whatever cut down to people that they're actually going to spend more time with, do a second meeting. They might start a little bit of due diligence. They might want to see a demo. So now 20 or 30 of their 300, they're going deeper on. Now they might decide to take two or three of those to their partnership. So most VCs, unless they're really small, single partner kind of VCs, most VCs have to go to investment committee. And so most VCs aren't going to take something to their investment committee unless they're really, really sure it has a high chance of getting done and approved. Okay. So out of that 20 or 30, they're rolling it down to maybe two or three that they're going to take to the investment committee. And this is critical, like political capital for that partner, because within the VC, there's politics. So you want to be known as the person who brings good deals that get done and have huge returns. And the person who does that gets more and more of their deals approved. So when you're a younger partner, you're fighting to make sure you bring only your absolute best. So they have nothing to do with whether or not they think you're a good deal or you're a good entrepreneur. They're trying to find the perfect deal that's going to get through that investment committee. And out of those two or three, they take the investment committee. They might get one or two funded. So if you look at those numbers of 300 down to one or two, and you have to say, well, why would they take so many meetings? Well, they take so many meetings, first of all, because they use it a lot to understand what's going on in the market. I mean, I've had 100 VCs tell me that basically I, my pitches, even though I know it's not a, not a winner from you know, the minute they start. I learn, I hear what's going on in the market. I hear Intel about somebody moved here, somebody's quitting here, this company did that. It's part of their research and development. 
Um, and it helps them refine their thesis over time too. So the pitch, the, the constant pitching is a part of it. But if you realize walking into the deal that the overwhelming odds are that person is not going to write a check for politics or things that have nothing to do with you. And then the other thing I explain to people is like, how do you go from 300 pitches down to like 20 as a VC? Well, you use what's called fast filters, right? So you do things like, well, this is a kind of a cool deal, but they're in Boston and I'm in San Francisco and I'm not going to go to Boston for a board meeting every quarter. I only do things I can drive to my board meeting. Okay. So now you're down to a 40 mile circle around, you know, the headquarters. And then you talk about things like, you know, some people have a, you know, predisposition. They lost, they lost money on somebody who had brown hair. So they just have a, you know, people have brown hair and have a Southern accent, just don't work for them. Like people have these like fast filters. I won't do anything that uh, requires enterprise sales, even though it could be wildly profitable. I won't do it. So they have these fast filters to get down to that 20 or 30. And so when you do fast filters, there's really no time to stop and be considerate. There's no time to really stop and like think about the nuances and you would hope that VCs do that. And some, you know, get a chance to do that once and twice in their career. But the majority of the time, it's just really, really fast filters to get down to the 20 or 30 they want to spend some time with. So if you embrace that, then you don't take it personal. You know, Leo DiCaprio did 100, you know, pitches before he got his first movie casting. Billy Joel was told he was too ugly. You know, Lady Gaga said her nose wouldn't work. Everybody's been told a thousand things. It's a person who doesn't quit in this process. And if you kind of desensitize yourself and just say, this is a numbers game, and, in, you know, it's also cliche to say, enjoy the journey. But I think in pitching, I always tell people pitch as soon as you possibly can get on the next phone call because you start to learn. And that's where I'm going to end. So, from, you know, dispel the myth to understand the VC process so you don't get your feelings hurt. And three, look at it as a journey to learn. I think the first time you tell your stupid, broken, horrible pitch, you start learning what works and doesn't work. And the second or third time you do it, it's a little bit better. And maybe by the 10th time you do it, it's kind of spot on. And I've seen pitches change my product roadmap. I've seen pitches tell me critical information about competitors. And I've seen uh, pitches definitely help me find and recruit people that I knew were leaving or shakeups in other companies. So enjoy the journey for way more than ending up on a check and you'll end up with a check. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Super helpful. Love your well-rounded perspective on anything. Every time you talk um, is really helpful for people and you can see it in the comments and you can always see it after the chats too. So thank you for that. Um, we'll have you have more events as well. Um, at this point, we have finished all the pitches. I will talk for a little bit, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending. So you feel free to drop whenever you want. Um, I'll kind of just say, you know, I, I, I release videos um, all the time on LinkedIn. So um, I'll give you guys, so some of you guys are new to me. Some of you guys are not. Um, I talk specifically fast, especially when it's recorded, because I know you guys can go back and watch it. I'm very different in mentoring sessions where it's a lot of just listening, absorbing your guys' information, then giving you guys prescriptive advice. Um, so I do talk fast a little intentionally just because I know it's recording and I know there's a lot of uh, a, a big audience here. Whereas on mentoring, I, I, I watch eye movement, body language, tone of voice, micro expressions, millimeter by millimeter, millisecond by millisecond. I adjust um, on the fly to everybody, but today will be a little bit different. So my whole goal in life for people that are new to me, impact 3 billion people, crazy ambitious. I figured I'm not responsible for 7 or 8 billion people. There are other impactors in the world. Also, if I just died saying I only impacted 1 billion people, that for me would be kind of boring, given my knowledge of um, AI and um, and and networking and business and people science and things like that. And so um, I had a super social phase in my life where I was like snowboarding, skydiving, surfing, festivals, dinner parties, game parties. Um and I did all, I had all the attention, all the money and all the fun and I, and, and I got bored of it. Um, so at some point I was just like halfway down a mountain snowboarding on a hill and, uh, with like 12 of my friends on a four day Airbnb out of state trip. And, uh, I was just like, I'm one thought was like, I'm bored and two, I'm meant for more than this. And so, um, that's when I decided I'm going to go after impacting 3 billion people. And what does it take to impact 3 billion people? That means run, invest, advise in a thousand plus companies, um, globally, um, a thousand plus. Um, that also means build the world's largest investor and founder network. So I have a global founder investor network that I pull in for events like this, and I'm building it larger and larger. Um, and it's going to be, it, it's intended to be defensible, defensible and collateralized on the high quality, high scale founder. And so me as a, me, uh, Esther, um, and a lot of other partners globally, uh, we will be founder mentoring. So I'm building out a founder mentoring army. Um, I mentor across a thousand founders every 90 days. I'm doing eight to 10 countries a day on Zoom calls all day, every day. I love it. I live for it. You can wake me up at 2 a.m. and 2 a.m. and talk about unit economics. And it's like a Coachella party for me. Um, I view every company and person. It's a, it's in the background. It's a polynomial function. I've been at million dollar. I don't, I don't care for attention, but I want you guys to have the 
background of my experience so that you guys know when I talk, here's the perspective of what it's coming from. Um, I've been a million dollar and billion dollar companies, D2C, B2B, public and private, managed teams of teams of people, did $100,000 a day media buying budgets, $10,000 a month as well. Um, built four billion dimensional matrix algorithms for funnel analysis um, on, on massive scalable companies. Um, everything from the colors and words on the web pages um, to the problem being solved to the copy. We were able to change like one word in one instance and made $300,000 difference because of the one word change in your roughly 15 words of attention space that you have on the top of your copy lines in the top of your hooks, which is the top of your entire funnel on social media before it goes through a CTR rate, which is one to 2% globally, CBR rates three to 8% globally. And then obviously B2B sales and um, VSLs are going to be different. They could be anywhere from five to 15%, depending on how good your sales or sales team or sales team average is. So million dollar billionaire companies, DTC, B2B, public, private, managed teams and teams of people, did $100,000 a day media buying budgets, did AI on a project with the FAI and executive service, did billion scale code. I've done and managed nearly every role in a company and I share those lenses and perspectives with people on the call. Now mentoring a thousand, a thousand plus founders um, every day and, and every, every, every 90 days. Um, which is which is like roughly 12 a day and 12, 30 minute calls is only six hours of work. So out of 18 hours a week, I still have two thirds of my day where I'm casual, free, relaxed um, and have lots of time for for uh, relaxing with girlfriend and making more partnerships and and still growing out from there. Um, I teach founders to do really good with the delegation and automation. And so I will never, ever be busy as we move into billion scale because of the automation and then the delegation that I focus on that I also teach to founders and share those perspectives with. So this is a lot of fun for me, um, being that I've touched on copy and and founders and human science. One of the things we're doing when we create the high quality, high scale founder is we look at personal development growth of humans. So to be a great founder, you have to be a great human. To be a founder that can pull in customers, partners, investors, and employees, those four, we want people to be able to communicate to and relate to a wide variety of people at scale. A founder does not and should not know everything that would bottleneck the company to say, I'm not smart enough to be a founder. A founder does not need to know everything. They need to know people science so that they can hire the best marketers, the best engineers, et cetera. And you're able to hire these really skilled marketers, engineers, accountants, et cetera, when you collateralize pulling them in with your vision and your ability to ex execute at least a small percentage of that vision. This is important because as people are pulling people in, you don't need top dollar to pull in top talent. You don't need top amount of equity to pull in talent. Most people are just looking at money and equity. You can actually collateralize in this third area of vision. A lot of people that have gone through their career, like I went through my career as an IC individual contributor before management, before C-suite, before VC, et cetera. People go and do all these things. They make all their money. And then at some point, they get tired of the money at, at some point. Um, and then they they move on to, I want mission. I want vision. I want to make an impact. And so they want to join a team. And then the last thing, they don't want to join a team that just says they have a pie in the sky, great vision. They want to see somebody who has experience. And that's the way investors are looking at pitches on the call too, is they hear these ideas all the time. I look at over a hundred pitches a week. That's why I made the short 10 sentence format pitch, which is a condensed form of a pitch deck because I look at hundred a week. And when I'm launching these events, sometimes I'm getting 50 to 70 a day. So I scanned for 10 to 10 to 12 seconds on each one. And I actually have it all mapped out. So, um, and I look for traction and I look for a team, right? Because that is what says this vision, this idea is actually doable by this person, right? Um, also as investors and as founders, you want to be consistent on your journey over a seven to 10 year IPO run or over a one to two year run on shorter, smaller companies, because there are going to be a lot of shorter, smaller companies. Um, it's companies that, you know, might take a year or two to get off the ground. A lot of them now you can get them off the ground in a week, two weeks because of AI, because of mentoring, because of venture studios, like nobody studios, um, studio hub and all the studios there. Um, right. So there's a lot of ways you can de-risk this entire process. Venture studios, what one of the things they allow you to do, right. Is bringing in that top marketing engineering talent that maybe they have in-house or they have connections to that you wouldn't necessarily be able to pull with your vision and percentage of execution, but because the venture studio does have that ability to execute and, 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 how many times they've done it and they have a process, right? That's able to pull in more talent, which changes the economics of that polynomial function of your company and how well it runs. Um, and when I'm referencing a polynomial function, what we're talking about is if you start with a basic product and you say whether it's lemonade or a Tesla car, you have a certain difficulty gradient built into how much it takes to build lemonade super easy and then hard on a, on a Tesla end, right? That difficulty gradient 
is what causes it changes your CTR rate at the top of funnel because the more difficult something is, the more people are really going to want it, right? If it's really easy to solve like Lemonade, a lot of people are not going to be, let me click on this ad real quick for Lemonade, right? They're going to go after something that is maybe in the dating category. Now, obviously dating category is going to be a hard thing to solve. These apps aren't able to solve it properly, right? But the theory is if it's harder to solve, it's going to cause more of a click rate because there's more of an emotional buildup towards it because nobody solved it or solved it really, really well yet. So the difficulty gradient going into your product and the sales of your product is the starting function of how, how effective you can get that CTR and CVR rate. That's the baseline. Then your CTR and CVR rate is based on how well worded it is to the customer. A lot of people are stuck in solution language because as a founder, you are providing a solution. So you're buried in solution language. And a lot of times people in their social media, organic or paid posts or, or web pages are talking about the solution top of funnel. You might be able to talk about it more mid funnel or bottom funnel or in your product or service after purchase. But the more people talk about their solution language top of funnel, the more it doesn't resonate with people, right? If I go out there as a founder mentor and I say, hey, listening is really important. Personal development is really important. I say that at the top of my post and I've done that before just to play around. It doesn't get conversion. It doesn't get traction. They're not care. No one cares about it, right? Like Trevor's saying in the comment, no one cares what you build sometimes. Um, so, but what matters is that problem language, right? So what are founders looking for? They're looking for funding. And so I need to use that funding language and say, guess what? I'm running these super founder pitch events. Here's how you get your funding. And I will genuinely tell you the, the way of getting funding. But the thing is, to whether people come in for uh, funding, right? Their, their, their top of mind is I need funding um, and, and or I need to know what's the best company strategy. And so I'll put that at the top of post and I'll say, here's what you need to do to get those things. And then we backtrack it from there. To get funding, you need to be a high quality, high scale founder. What does that mean? Okay, you need to have great company strategy. You need to have great projections, which are based in standard CTR and CVR rates worldwide standard sales rates, standard processes of running company. And you need to be able to hire people and pull people into the team. How are you going to do that? You got to be a good, you could be able to be good with communication. How, what is communication modulated by? It's based on traumas, insecurities, personal developments, things like where you you hear one word and, and you think somebody else meant something else, but you're, you're, you, you might be projecting in, right? So we got to get really good at the communication. One of the best things, there's all these different value domains, whether it's money, equity, brand, authority, et cetera. One of the best value domains is the communication domain because it affects how you pull in investors, customers, partners, employees, manage uh, attracting and maintaining, retaining employees, right? And so communication is one of the best areas we can grow in. When you, and, and we want to fail often. A lot of people are afraid to fail coming from a perfectionist mindset and, and afraid to fail, but we actually want people to fail 10 times a day. And so fail 10 times a day in how you run your ads, but do micro tests, do $100 tests. I have the second largest YouTube media buyer in the world on my team, $250,000 a day. Um, and he, uh, whenever, whenever they're getting, they're getting these 10, $50 million budgets to spend in a particular month, they start with hundred dollar ad budgets. I've seen some people that I'm mentoring where they're like, let's go do a, let's go do a 10 or $20,000 video. And I'm like, no, don't start with a big thing. Start with your micro test so that you can micro fail, micro fail in ads, micro fail in how you manage and micro fail in everything. Um, test something for 15 minutes or an hour and get your iterations in so that you can fail. Write down in a journal or in your iPhone notes how many times you failed today. If you can fail 10 times today, that means you got 10 learnings today. And the learnings is something you'll never lose. You might lose money. You might lose relationships in life, but you will not lose your learnings. And so failures is something you want to be able to pursue. You want to have a high failure tolerance and a high emotional tolerance. So writing those things down helps so that you can actually celebrate failures. I've, I've as, I, as I mentor founders, I often tell them, go out to dinner, like literally go celebrate that you failed on this thing, right? Because you get a massive learning from it. And that, that stack of learnings is, is what's going to get you to win. There is a, if you look at a 30 day period, you should be able to, in some cases, fail 27 days. And then the last three days, you get to stack all those learnings together and you get your wins and your wins more than offset your losses. That is a normal failure science. If you're cooking a meal, you have different ingredients, salt, pepper, all these different things. You have the variables of the ingredients and the values of how much. It variables times values equals a X and Y axis dimensional matrix. And I'm not going to get too mathy for you guys. I've done sophisticated algorithms, but at a high level, you just variables times values and it creates a 2D matrix. Not the 4 billion dimension one that, I'm, that, I've, that I've done that's more complex, but just a basic 2D, 2D, two dimensional one. And you would realize that if you had to test every variable and every value, every amount of salt, that would be a long time, right? In the algorithm world, we call that state space. That would take a lot of time. But what we can do is start to knock out entire variables, which knocks out a whole column, right? So it's like, if we start to taste a little bit of salt, and we know, you know what? I feel like salt is not a match at all for this meal. Then we get to cut out salt entirely, which just cuts out all the different doses that we were going to try of that, all the different values, which means now instead of saying variables times values, 
the number of combinations I'd have to try would traditionally take 100 years, but because I'm using a heuristic called taste, I'm able to cut out entire variables and values. This is what allows us to use the failure learnings to speed up the founder and company growing process is embracing that failure, extracting the learning, and the learning becomes a heuristic for how you're going to efficiently run that company, even though you don't even know exactly the timing of when you're going to get to success. As long as you follow the mechanisms of doing that and failing often, you succeed faster. So of all the domains you can fail in, ads, brand, authority, et cetera, communication is the number one domain to fail in. If you can say, I want to fail 10 times a day for the rest of my life in communication, that can guarantee your success alone. Just by saying, I'm going to fail 10 times a day in communication. That's going to win you because as you fail, you're going to learn, you're going to get better with investors, customers, employees. How do you manage teams and teams of people and learn to retain employees when a lot of employees will leave on average after 18 months? Is, is understanding when you interview them that you're not just interviewing them for an engineering or a marketing job saying, are you good for the job? And that's how most interviews go. And that's why we have most turnover. When you get into an interview, we want to start by asking, what do you want for your life? Forget about me. Forget about the company. Forget about the match of that for right now. What do you want for your life? Do you want to travel the world? Do you want to be the best product and science person in this? Like, what do you want? And that way we can map what their desires are personally and professionally to this role in the interview. And then in every weekly one-on-one -on -one that they are hired on, we're going to be reaching back out to that anchor point. Same thing for when you want to go find co-founders for a company. When you're looking for a co-founder in a company or you're looking for a partner in life, you want to ask, what do you want over the next five to 10 years? If you just match up on current matching of I want this now and you want this now, it's not going to last over time. We have to look at the five-year horizon. We have to look at the 10-year horizon and we have to say, okay, are we going in the same direction? Are we both going to New York? Are we both going to Dubai? And what is the rate we're going, right? If I want to go impact 3 billion people, but somebody else only wants to impact a million people, they are not going to be aligned with my speed. The people that are closest to me are aligned with the size goals. Ambition is my number one trait. So people that want to align at the highest percentage with me and spend the most time and energy where I spend my most time and energy is the highest ambitious, right? So we, when, we, when we look at people, whether it's employees for the duration that they're going to be in the company and embrace that they'll only be there a short time, 18 months, 24 months, three, three years, C-suites, obviously you want them there longer as long as you can, um, but be realistic about that there's, there's a turnover rate. Um, and, and you can change that turnover rate by asking people those personal questions and getting aligned. So... Um, this is a high level. I'm not going to go into too much more. There's so much we can go into from copy to how you manage projects to what people science is to how to read micro expressions to a, to a millimeter, millimeter detail and understand people and then also not over not not bias and, and do that properly and ask questions in the verbal space. Um, this is my passion. I will do this all day, every day. Um, I love doing it. Anybody who wants to um, jump in um and and partner up uh i'm partnered with venture studios accelerators and incubators and vcs around the world um i love doing these things we will be doing a lot more of these defensible pitch events lots of capital lots of founders um and we're going to scale it up and it's gonna be a lot of fun so i hope you guys enjoyed today uh we will be doing these events every two weeks pitch events are monthly and speaking events are monthly which means i have a we will have an event every two weeks one of our next events might be one of the like top ai events so we have some of the top ai um, people in the world, uh, people that have managed systems that do $30 billion in a day um, and open AI, people at OpenAI, um, Google, Microsoft, we might do an AI event soon. We also have some of the top marketers in the world, um, literally number two and others. So we'll do some marketing events. We'll also do more founder events and have more people like Mark McNally and other multi-billion dollar exit founders and VCs and investors talking. Um, and my whole goal is at the end of the day, let's make humanity even better and even more beautiful. That's all I care about is just make that better, right? It's, it starts, my, my focus is that 3 billion people um, and then everything else is just a plan laddering up to that. And I love positive, passionate people. This is what energizes me every day. Burnout is not a function of time and energy. Burnout is a function of misalignment. And so when we're aligned for our goals and what we want to do, we are able to do it more 24-7. So hope you guys enjoyed. Um, this will end the recording and cheers.